Hello and welcome to panel two of today's Schiller Institute conference. There is no climate emergency. Apply the science and economics of development to stop blackouts and death. Now, before we get started with our panel, we want to take a moment to recognize uh, those scientists and thinkers that have passed from the scene in the past year plus uh, who were dedicated to speaking the truth boldly about this matter uh, as the first commitment that they had to their chosen life's vocation. As we heard this morning uh, from a economist and statesman, Lyndon LaRouche, who himself passed away in 2019, the choice for a commitment to discover the good goes beyond the mortal confines and the uh, mortal aspirations of anyone, and the truth has to be kept as, pri as primary, whatever the costs may be, to an individual. And these were people that lived by that idea. I want to start by uh, talking about Tom Weissmiller. Uh, Tom was someone that worked with us, particularly starting in about 2015 to my direct uh, uh, work with him uh, when we were first at the United Nations talking about the idea that uh, global warming was population reduction and not science. He was born in the Netherlands and emigrated with his family to the United States in 1948, graduated from Bayside High School in Queens in 1961, had an early job at the Royal Dutch Weather Bureau, went on to attend NYU, uh, the New School for Social Research, Long Island University, uh, and had ties there really all the way through his life, including to the uh, new NYU Alumni Association, which he acted as the president of for many years, uh, and was responsible, at least in my case, for meeting many other people who were involved in this field. There was Dennis Avery. Uh, who died in 2020. He was a senior fellow with the Heartland Institute and the director of the Center for Global Food Issues. Uh, he wrote various books. One was Unstoppable Global Warming Every 1500 Years. Uh, there was one called Saving the Planet with Pesticides and Plastic, The Environmental Triumph of High Yield Farming. And he had a very particular interest in the idea of Global Food Progress, another one of the books that he wrote. It was Dr. Hal Doiron, who also uh, passed away last year. And as a young physicist, he had joined NASA, was involved in 1963, he got there, and he developed the, the Apollo Loon Module Landing Dynamic Simulation Software that was used to guide the landing gear designed for toppling stability and energy absorption performance. Um, he did some work also on Skylab as well, and he uh, led the space shuttle team from 1972 to 79 uh, that uh, did much important work on the safety elements of that program. Uh, in 2012, he was, uh, together with another 48 NASA sci sci scientists, uh, a signer on a letter that disputed climate change and was extremely active in this field. And then finally, Freeman Dyson, uh, famous uh, to a lot of people for various reasons. Um, did a lot of work in astrophysics, mathematics, uh, uh, nuclear physics, engineering. He was at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Uh, I was able to visit uh, with him as a result of a meeting, uh, two meetings that were actually organized by a colleague of mine, uh, Suzanne Klebe. She and I went and saw him. And here's one of the reasons we went. Uh, as you'll read, if you look him up in the old w Wikipedia, uh, uh, you know, default, uh, it says, you know, Dyson disagreed with the scientific consensus on climate change. Uh, he believed that some of the effects of increased CO2 levels are favorable and not taken into account by climate scientists, such as increased agricultural yield, and further that the positive benefits of CO2 likely outweigh the negative effects. He was skeptical about the simulation models used to predict climate change, arguing that political efforts to reduce causes of climate change distract from other global problems that should take priority. Uh, he also signed the World Climate Declaration that was entitled, There Is No Climate Emergency. And of course, that's partially the title of today's uh, meeting. 
And I cite uh, Dyson, who had many disagreements, including with us, including with uh, our, our uh, scientific perspective, but who was a forthright uh, uh, advocate whenever he saw it clear of the scientific truth. And for that, and for what the uh, others did, we all we just want to take this moment at the beginning of the conference panel and recognize them. To give greetings to the conference today, we're going to start with uh, Colonel Walter Faggett, who is the former chief medical officer of the Department of Health of Washington, D.C. He's the co-chairman right now in Washington, D.C. of the Ward 8 Health Council. Uh, and his brief greeting is on the topic, The Good War, The Mission of Public Health. I th we think you're muted there, Alt Walter. Okay, peace and blessings uh, to all uh, the attendees to this outstanding and very provocative conference. Uh, again, as a retired colonel, uh, the United States Army, uh, I joined my senior military colleagues in welcoming the end of war, that's for sure. And perhaps now we can better wage a war against pandemics uh, and other problems. Uh, again, I think uh, one thing that uh, we need to really remember is a statement from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, that the success of any, success or failure of any government in the final analysis must be measured by the well-being of its citizens. Nothing can be more important to a state than its public health. The state's paramount concern should be the health of its people. And again, hopefully uh, in this panel, we'll be able to share uh, some of the opportunities uh, for collaborative efforts to improve the health of the world. Thank you so much for joining us on this panel. Thank you very much, Walter, and we'll be talking with you later on when we get to the discussion section. Uh, Walter is one of the founding members of something called the Committee for the Coincidence of Opposites. And this is a, an organization that was created last year at the request of the next speaker. Uh, seeing the crisis that had erupted uh, in the context of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, and recognizing that that was merely one sign or symptom of a general diseased circumstance that had begun to visit the globe as a whole, uh, Helga Zeppelin-Rouche requested that what begin is a form of dialogue and discussion among people from various fields, and they should be brought together, and they should begin to uh, have to confront and to uh, uh, redirect uh, their mistaken ideas or limited ideas to take into consideration what the general welfare of humanity had, be, it had to be. And so she is working specifically on certain projects, which she's going to tell us a bit about. But besides that, I just want to say that today's uh, effort, uh, so far as seen in our first panel and what will be uh, following, is intended to provide for everybody from the layman to the expert the opportunity to rethink rephrase uh, uh, what uh, they themselves are thinking about issues and ideas at the highest level uh, and in the deepest way. New policies have to be initiated, and they may go way beyond the boundaries of what people think, uh, but that's exactly what true scientific inquiry requires, uh, and it's in that image uh, that the Committee for the Coincidence of Opposites, uh, named in the uh, honor of Nicholas of Cusa, who she'll certainly talk about a bit, uh, was done. And so it's always my honor to introduce the founder and chairman of the Schiller Institute, Helga sepp -Rouche. Hello, I greet you wherever you may be. Uh, and I, I'm really responding to what was said in the first panel. And as a world citizen, which I proud myself to be, I'm also a patriot. And in that capacity, it really gets to me that Germany is becoming the laughing stock of the entire world. Formerly, Germany was a very proud nation of poets, of thinkers, of inventors, admired by the whole world for these qualities. But since a while, it seems that Germany can't get anything done anymore. Now, Merkel 
uh, will soon be out of office. She was in that office for 16 years. And that is about the time when she has to be concerned about how she will look in the history books. And I'm quite certain that Merkel will be the synonym for the image of a failing Germany. Now, you remember that after the uh, <coughs> tsunami in Fukushima, uh, she uh, decided together with some very bad advisors to have the exit of Germany from nuclear energy. And I remember I had meetings in Washington at that time and people in the Congress and elsewhere were very upset and they said, what is going on in Germany? You must have an ace up your sleeve. Have, have you gotten a breakthrough in fusion? Because nobody could imagine that a high technology, high industrialized country like Germany would exit nuclear energy without having an alternative in place. But that's exactly what was the case. Now, the decision has been made by the EU and naturally Germany as well to exit coal and fossil fuels in general. And you would think that there is an alternative in place. Absolutely not. You would need a territory of the size of Portugal to put up all the windmills and solar panels. And that is about the territory of Baden-Württemberg, um, <clears throat> Rheinland-Pfalz, Hessen and Thuringer, which is, you know, a good portion of Germany. And obviously this is not realistic. And now they want to put these solar panels and wind parks into Africa, even South Africa, completely unworkable. Look at what happened with the uh, airport for Berlin, the BER. This lasted to get finished about a felt several decades. I think it was a little bit more than a decade. Ridiculous. The, the Chinese put up such airports in two years or three years. The maglev was invented and tested in Germany first. Do you see any maglev, even a test track in Germany? No, but in China, they have now the first track uh, going uh, 600 kilometers per hour and, you know, building more grids uh, nationwide or fast train systems of which you can only dream of in Europe or in the United States. Now, when the recent flood occurred, which we have heard about already in North Rhine-Westphalia, Rhineland-Pfalz, this was emphatically not the result of climate change, but of man-made failure. The inability to act in time, despite the fact that the knowledge about the coming stark rain and, and danger of over flooding was there for one week earlier. Um, now, instead, you know, instead of uh, responding uh, to that failure, Merkel, um, after the flood had devastated the whole region, um, she said, oh, now we have to get faster in the fight against climate change. Now, when she was together with the mayor of the town of Schuld, uh, Helmut Lussi, uh, the mayor sort of contradicted her, not by saying so, but by simply reporting the chronology of floods in Schuld, 1790, 1910, and then now the recent one. And, you know, since this is very close to my home region, I'm born in Trier and I know the Moselle very well. And if you travel along the Moselle, uh, you find uh, everywhere water gauges uh, which show how high the water was in what year. And you can actually see that there were many floods over the century. Uh, now, in the 14th century, such a flood may have been a natural catastrophe, but not in 2021, because nine days before, the satellite pictures were there, and they showed increasingly as the day uh, days went on, three days before the flood occurred, uh, before the rain started to pour, they had exactly uh, orientations which cities and towns would be hit. Uh, then they named all the towns which are now de de devastated. So why did more than 170 people have to die and many more are still missing? I mean, this is Germany. This is not Bangladesh. The warning was not communicated. 
There were no sirens, not radio did report it, nor TV. There were no apps. And with hours, within hours, the smartphones were dead because there was no electricity. Now, the reason for this horrendous failure is the absolutely horrible image of man which goes along with the green ideology. This has so much clouded the thinking in Germany, um, you know, that they don't get anything straight anymore. And that image of man is actually the same for the Greens uh, and the financial oligarchy. They all refer in a s almost pseudo-religious deif deif de deification uh, of, of nature. And this goes actually back to a mythology uh, of a cyclical notion of the world, um, which goes al along with a circular economy. Uh, and that is the pre-Christian heathen idea of Gaia. Now, in that ideology, man is regarded as a parasite, as a pollutant. And it is unsaid, but quite acknowledged and, and, and agreed upon that the fewer people there are, the better. Now, this queen ideology, unfortunately, not is no longer only the ideology of the Greens, the Green Party. But in Germany, all parties have become green. I mean, we fought this for you know, almost uh, 50 years since, since the Club of Rome put out their fraudulent report about limits to growth. We fought about that and have made a zillion conferences, um, published hundreds of articles and, and many books. But, you know, the financial powers to be, the city of London, Wall Street and alike, have poured all their money into the propagation of this green ideology. As a result, in Germany right now, all parties are green. All the big DAX firms have bought into the green deal of Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the EU Commission. And Merkel, a few days ago, um, was asked, this was asked after the flood catastrophe, she was asked by, I think, a Japanese journalist Will the nuclear energy in Germany be permanent? And she said, the die is cast. Uh, any future governments will not change that. Now, what arrogance is that? What notion and understanding of democracy? How can she say something about future government, which happened to be, or supposedly, the result of the German voters voting? Uh, so, you know, I mean, she is really uh, the symbol for a failed Germany. And, you know, I was hesitating many times to attack her, uh, you know, because she, you know, may, sometimes made a little thing a little bit better than the worst hawks of the neocons. And in some respects, you know, she is not quite that bad. But if, you, if I hear something like that, you know, on drawing on perpetuating the lie that the flood was the result of climate change, that she will stick to nuclear energy uh, exit, uh, you know, this is really uh, uh, too much. Merkel says, après nous le déluge, after us the flood. And she is giving that word a new meaning. Now, if this outlook prevails, the prognosis is that Germany will vanish as an industrial nation uh, or even as a nation altogether, like many civilizations uh, did disappear, because right now it is on the course of a failed nation. And I have said many times, and I repeat it here, that if Germany continues on its present course, you will find in a few years or decades the relics of Germany in museums in Africa, in China, in India, uh, and, you know, for Merkel, who claims to be a natural scientist, to make such remarks after the flood means this woman is completely either learning resistant or, you know, she takes the side of the financial oligarchy. Now, that remains to be judged uh, which. What is so worrisome is that this is the characteristic of almost the entire Western establishment. They have policy failure after policy failure. 
And despite of that, and despite the fact that everybody can see it, they portray a complete inability to reflect on the causes. Namely, that infrastructure should not be left to the private interest uh, or a policy of the Black Zero. Intra infrastructure belongs to the realm of the common good and therefore must be the responsibility of the state. Flood should be, this flood should be understood as a resounding warning signal that we have to go back to a policy of the common good and the people up front. Now let me look at another example, which seems to be unrelated, but it is not. That is the failure of the establishment in respect to the corona pandemic. Now already in 1973, my late husband, Lyndon LaRouche, initiated a biological Holocaust task force, which had the job to investigate the impact of the IMF conditionality on the developing sector, because it was already clear that that conditionality which prescribed that third world countries had to pay their debt before they were allowed to invest in infrastructure, health system, education, leave alone uh, industrialization. And you know, if you do, if you do that, you, you lower the, int uh, the living standard and the, uh, therefore the immune system by you know, not allowing the population to develop. And he predicted that if you would do this over a longer period of time, it would lead to the emergence of old uh, <clears throat> and new diseases and pandemics. <clears throat> now, for almost 50 years, there was done essentially nothing from the side of you know, the IMF, the World Bank, Europe, the United States, other industrialized countries to help the developing countries to overcome that development. So therefore, the population of the so-called third world, uh, you know, <clears throat> was left basically until China came with the new Silk Road and started to build uh, railways and uh, industrial parks and similar things which started to overcome the poverty uh, also uh, in, in the developing countries. What was done in the West instead, instead of listening to uh, the warnings of La Rouge, they went ahead with the privatization of the health sector. Uh, that led to the outsourcing of the production of medical and pharmaceutical supplies into cheap labor markets. It led to a reduction of hospital beds and hospitals and a general, you know, moving, uh, lowering the supplies of healthcare uh, to the populations, um, creating a two class society, you know, the rich on the one side, the poorer parts of the society on the other side. And when COVID-19 hit, there was an incredibly slow response. Uh, there were for a month, no masks, no protective gear, no respiratory machines. And an enormous time was lost despite a spectacular, uh, the spectacular speed of development of vaccines, um, you know, which, which is a laudable uh, uh, result, but mainly due to uh, the ingenuity of, of uh, medical scientists, the United States, in the United States, more than 600,000 lives were lost. In the world, so far, more than officially 4 million. But if one considers that in India alone, it is estimated that the factor of mortality is five to 10 times higher than officially uh, counted in Africa as well, simply because people are not counted when they die in the bed at home, uh, one can actually uh, calculate how many more millions uh, have, have really died. Now, the immediate response of the Schiller Institute was to call for the construction of a world health system, meaning to build a modern health system in every single country of the planet. Because it was clear when you have a pandemic, um, you know, there will be mutations, and in the worst case, it will make the vaccines ineffective. Now, in, if every country would have had 
a health system like China had in Wuhan, where they were able to have a rapid response, did immediate testing, isolation, quarantine, building new hospitals with 1,000 beds in one week. The pandemic was contained after two months and it could not, it would not have become a pandemic because it would not have spread worldwide in the same way. Now, instead, uh, vaccines were brought, uh, bought and in some cases hoarded by the rich countries, which led to a complete and is leading to a complete devastation in the developing countries. There are now massive mutations, uh, Delta, a very aggressive uh, variant, uh, very contagious. There's already Lambda. Um, and as a result uh, of the lockdown of the so-called inofficial economy, you have a famine of biblical dimensions, uh, as David Beasley of the World Food Program uh, called it, with 270 million people in danger of starvation this year. Now, three days ago, uh, the CDC in the United States was warning about outbreaks of a superbug called Candida auris fungus, a fungus uh, in, in nursing homes in DC and in two hospitals in Dallas. Now there, the patients are resistant to all categories of treatment. And it's the first time there is a clustering of resistance and patients are getting infected from each other. Now, this is a fungus which was known for years, but it is the first time that it has spread from person to person. Now, this is not a, a virus, it's not a bacteria, but a fungus, fungi have cells and virologists uh, <clears throat> are certain um, that new pandemics are coming uh, and we are approaching very quickly the condition Linda LaRouche has warned about that if you suppress the immune system of entire continents over long periods of time, there will be an interaction of biological processes leading to a biological holocaust. And, you know, the pandemic is not over. And if you have now these new developments branching into other categories, I think we are looking at a very, very serious health condition of the whole world. And that is not being paid attention to yet in any form worth talking about. Now, let me look at a certain area of utter failure of policy. That is 20 years of the Afghanistan war, or one could say all the interventionist wars, Iraq, Libya, Syria, where all which is left is almost scorched earth millions of civilians dead, populations now living in unimaginable misery. In Afghanistan, $2.2 trillion were spent. 3,300 American soldiers died, 59 German soldiers, far over 100,000 Afghanis were killed. Now this war was ill-defined from the very beginning and latest when the Afghanistan papers were published in 2018. Uh, <clears throat> basically, you know, it should have been acknowledged and troops which should have been pulled out immediately. Now, if the troop withdrawal from Afghanistan only will lead to a realignment and redeployment to con concentrate instead on the containment of China and Russia by focusing on the Indo-Pacific, then pe people and institutions have learned nothing out of this 20 years of a futile war, which if this confrontation with Russia and China is continued, potentially can lead to a thermonuclear extinction. Now the situation in Afghanistan represents a crossroad. For probably only a short period of time, there is the potential of a change of paradigm. The Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, and the Afghan ambassador to China have all stated that there is the potential for a cooperation between Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Iran, the United States, and European nations. 
and the integration of Afghanistan into the entire Eurasian land bridge, the Belt and Road Initiative, the new Silk Road, to extend the China-Pakistan economic corridor to Afghanistan into Central Asia, replace the opium production with modern agriculture and industry. Now, this cooperation between Russia, China, and the US in the small could build the bridge for a future cooperation in the large, avoiding a strategic confrontation and replacing it with a win-win cooperation. This could be the start of building a world health system by building a modern health system in Afghanistan, which has presently no health system worth speaking about, to build modern hospitals in Afghanistan, training programs for medical personnel, provide and build electricity production, clean water, build up infrastructure in Afghanistan and the entire region once called the land of the thousand cities and make it no longer the battleground for the great game, the control of the Eurasian continent, but a turning point in human history of cooperation and mutual benefit of all people. I think we should start the era of the adult age of mankind and focus on the common aim of our human species. Don't you think it's time to overcome the poverty for 4 billion people? It cannot be that people live in such miserable conditions like you see it in Yemen, in Syria, in many countries in Africa and Latin America forever. China has demonstrated it can be done. The finding of cures for deadly diseases would be another one of such common aims of mankind. And the rapid development of vaccines for COVID-19 again has demonstrated it can be done once you mobilize the political will. International cooperation in space science to erect villages on the moon, cities on Mars, to join forces for the asteroid defense of the planet Earth. These are the common aims of mankind we should be concentrating on. Now, it is not clear if all of these questions can be addressed, but I think it requires people of goodwill to hold these establishments, which are obviously learning resistant and have not shown any desire or willingness to reflect on these policy failures to hold them accountable. And I would hope that this conference and this discussion will be one big step in this direction. Thank you, Helga. Uh, we are going to be getting to questions and discussion in a bit. But what I want to do now is to introduce our next speaker, and that is Dr. Kelvin Kim of South Africa. He's a nu nuclear physicist and former chairman of the South African Nuclear Energy Corporation. His topic, the necessity of nuclear power for Africa. I'm Dr. Kelvin Kim. I'm a nuclear physicist in Pretoria, South Africa, and somebody who takes great interest in the whole climate change saga, who is it is directly linked to people's attitudes towards nuclear power and other forms of generating electricity. If one looks at Africa, Africa is huge. Africa is bigger than the United States, China, Europe, and the UK, and India all added together. People don't realize that. There are huge distances. Many African countries do not have sophisticated grids like you find across Europe, for example. Here in South Africa, it is also very large. The distances are great in comparison to European countries. We are currently fortunate in South Africa to have one of the few energy ministers in the world, Wedi Mantashi, who's openly stating that he's pro-nuclear and there's a pro-nuclear move underway. Now, he has announced that he wants to put 2,500 megawatts of new nuclear into the system. And that is busy moving ahead. Now we're going through the processes of deciding exactly how this will be approached. There are about a dozen other African countries that have already 
told the International Atomic Energy Agency that they want to follow a nuclear future. The lifeblood of any country is electricity flowing reliably and inexpensively. Not from solar and wind, where the solar is absent at night or if it rains, or wind when you never know it's going to drop. It, that is just too uncertain to base the 21st century economy of an African country on whether or not the wind blows. We also, for example, have in Africa many African countries that are very dependent on hydro, which is also undesirable. You know why? An African dam looks like a saucer, very wide and not that deep. Here we have five-year droughts. Lake Kariba, I think, is well known to many Americans, which is a hydropower system as well. It was down to 25% full, something like 18 months ago. Effectively, the electricity disappears from hydro schemes like that. It's not like Norway or Nordic countries where there's a guaranteed water runoff, snow runoff all the time, so the, the hydro is reliable. It isn't. So we need small modular reactors in Africa, as well as big reactors on the coastlines where you have water or water cooling, which South Africa has. But for African countries, many people feel that African countries are too primitive, they're too behind the times to be nuclear. That's just so untrue. It's in fact easier to run a nuclear reactor, a nuclear power station, than all the solar and wind. Because a nuclear power station, once it's running, it runs reliably. You don't have to have multiple switching systems and the cloud has come over the solar panels and now you're switching there and there and it's thousands of kilometers apart. It's just far too complex. For anybody, Germany is suffering immensely now, all switching in and out and so on and so forth to try and keep a stable electricity supply. Why on earth should African countries be induced to put essentially very unreliable and complex electricity systems in place to build our economy? Why can't we put a reliable electricity system in place? Big nuclear, if it's using nuclear fuel elements, only has to be refueled every 18 months. The small modular reactors, you don't have to turn them off for refueling ever because they work by putting small balls as big as baseballs in and taking others out at the bottom. So they just keep running forever effectively. You only turn a small modular reactor off if you intentionally decide to do a maintenance program. And you've got then time to make a decision on what other electricity will be put in its place. Normally, you would like to have a few of these modular reactors together so that you've got the opportunity to switch when you like. Not when all of a sudden you get a rainy week and your solar power goes away. Or like in England at the moment, they've had very still wind conditions for the last number of days. I'm getting daily reports from the UK that there's effectively no wind. They're running on gas power and something like nearly 25% nuclear power made up of British nuclear and French nuclear exported under the North Sea from France. Why do that when they've deliberately wound down their coal, for example? So it is not fair for the dominance of the first world to be pushed onto African countries, and we are told we must tow the line to reduce CO2 to take out a tiny piece of the meat and the hamburger because somebody in Europe wants to feel good about it. And therefore, people in Africa are suffering by getting no electricity or otherwise they have to burn wood, cow dung, and all sorts of things like that as supposedly the environmentally friendly solution. That's wrong. We must make a distinction between climate and weather. Climate is something that you measure over decades, 30, 40 years at the minimum. Weather is something that can change in a day. Mark Twain said, climate is what we expect, but weather is what we get. And that is so true. Recently, there's been some serious flooding in Germany. That flooding in Germany is a weather incident. It is not climate change. There've been too many politicians trying to claim that it's a climate change result. It isn't. Similarly, with fires in Canada, the fires in Canada are not related to climate change. They're probably related to uh, forest management and such like, where there's too much 
material that is flammable that it hasn't been properly looked after. So hurricanes and so on hitting the coast are not things that are related to climate change. You know, the temperature has increased over the last 150 years. And that is since the time that Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States. It has increased by one degree Celsius. People who love to push the climate change argument like to say, since the onset of the industrial age, which gives an implied blame to the industrial age, but why don't we say since the time of Abraham Lincoln, which is the same time, then it doesn't have that implied blame in it. In it. You know, if we look back in history, we will find that there was a temperature increase during a period called the medieval warm period. That is extremely well documented in the scientific record, the historical record, and various others. That was followed by a very cold period called the Little Ice Age. That Little Ice Age occurred across the world, in fact, but it's particularly measurable in Europe because of the historic record and various other records. During that time, and that was the time of Shakespeare, the Thames froze over to such a degree that they could drive carriages down the Thames, horse-drawn carriages. There's even a record of an elephant walking across the Thames in London. The ice was so thick. That was the time that the Mayflower was arriving in the United States, and it was particularly cold. From then onwards, it started to warm. So there was a warming trend from the time of the Mayflower up until the time of the Cowboys and the Wild West of the United States, the opening up. That is the time of Sitting Bull, the time of the gunfight at the OK Corral, and so on. It was also the time that the railroads of the United States were expanding dramatically, and the time that farming in what was the Wild West then was spreading greatly. So in fact, if you were... Um, working in the U.S. at that time, the time of Wild Bill Hickok and such like, you would have been able to report that there was significant global warming has taken place since the time of Abraham Lincoln until then, the time of Sitting Bull, for example. And that was the case. So we then have to say, did that lead to climate change? What happened? Well, there were changes. Why? Well, one thing that you could not blame was industrial carbon dioxide, but there was definitely a temperature rise during that period. It's well documented. Then we went on to the period of the 1970s, for example, in the past century. During the 1970s, temperatures went down and they just before that, during the Second World War, had gone up, down in the 1970s, then up again, and then a dip, and so on. So the temperatures have gone up and down every so often over this period. They haven't been continuously rising, which is important, right? That's called monotonically increasing in mathematics. Now, in comparison... The carbon dioxide has been increasing monotonically. In other words, since the time of Abraham Lincoln until now, there has been an increase in the carbon dioxide all of the time. Now, your immediate instinct should be to say, if we are blaming the carbon dioxide for causing a temperature increase, how come the carbon dioxide kept increasing continuously, but in fact, the temperature didn't? Are they therefore linked? Now, let's have a look at the amount of carbon dioxide we're talking about. If I take the height of the Washington Monument, that obelisk in Washington, D.C., and I equate the height of the Washington Monument to the composition of the atmosphere, then the total amount of carbon dioxide in that height is equal to the height of a hamburger on the top of the monument. The amount of that carbon dioxide contributed by mankind since Abraham Lincoln is equal to the thickness of the meat in the hamburger. So can we really feel that the meat in the hamburger on top of the Washington Monument 
has caused floods in Germany. It just doesn't feel right. Think about it. That's what we want. We want people to think and not just listen to the stuff they read in popular magazines and newspapers and so on. Most people get their information from very popular sources and not actually from the original science or even close to the original science. So, since the time of Lincoln, the carbon dioxide has continuously gone up. But now why blame the carbon dioxide going up since the time of Lincoln till now as being the cause of the global warming that we see now? Because there has been some, one degree. If you clap your hands after a singer has performed a song, your hands go up by more than one degree. That's the temperature we're talking about, so it's minimal. Okay, I'm a physicist. So what I can tell you is it is the case that if you put a thermal loading somewhere in the atmosphere, that that temperature can make some sort of difference. I don't want to be attacked for ignoring it. So if some area gets particularly warm by a degree or two, then that heat can cause the air to rise up and therefore suck a wind in and therefore bring changes. That happens all of the time. That is what causes rain to arrive and what causes general change. But to blame an effect like that for the entire warming of the planet is, is very, very difficult. It's something that you really have to think about. If we now say, what is happening? Well, we have a political issue in all of this. So let's just go into the politics for a moment. If you look back and you say, what is going on? We've had lots of shouting that it's man-made carbon dioxide is the problem. If you try to say, no, maybe there's something else, you get shouted down. Now, that should be a clue. Why are you shouted down if you try to say something like that? Let me just for a moment say, just think of fundamental probability. Think of taking a coin and flipping a coin 50 times. Everybody knows that if you flip a coin 50 times, you'll expect half of them to come out heads and half of them to come out tails. So why is it that the projections that many people give us about the so-called results of global warming are all bad? How come? You hear, oh, global warming is going to lead to dryness in dry areas. Dry areas will get drier. There'll be less rain. Wet areas will get wetter and there'll be floods. Cold areas will get colder. Everything is worse. Why, why is that the case? Just on plain statistics, why isn't it that if there is global warming taking place, which there is, why should it not lead to dry areas getting more rain and therefore growing more crops? Why should it not be that wet areas get less rain and therefore lead to a much better lifestyle, less flooding and so on? Why is it that climate change is automatically assumed to bring only negativity. In fact, if you look back, you'll find that there's been global warming periods regularly back in history. There was the medieval warm period that I've already mentioned. Prior to that, there was the Roman warming. Prior to that, there was the Minoan warming. These are all well documented. They're in the historic record. The warming was also universal worldwide, by the way. In South Africa, there's a large a cave called the Wonderwerk Cave, which means the Wonderworks Cave in, in English. This cave is 140 meters deep, and it is a very dry, remote desert area. And so it hasn't been touched by humans much in many, many years, going back to cavemen days. They've discovered the earliest evidence of cavemen using fires have been discovered in this cave and so on, and has been examined a lot by archaeologists over the last number of years. There's evidence in that cave of the medieval warm period and of the cooling period and so on. There's also a few other cave systems and, and other geological areas in southern Africa that show the same medieval warm period and the little ice age and so on. So arguments that some people use, no, it was only a localized effect in Europe and therefore was not a worldwide effect, are just not true. It did happen all over the place. So why blame, blame 
man-made called anthropogenic carbon dioxide. Now, there's just no legitimacy to this. And in fact, if you have a look at the science, you'll discover that a far more plausible argument is the variation of magnetic field on the sun. The sun has massive variations in its magnetic field, and this can be measured, a simple mechanism, by the number of sunspots on the sun. The sunspot density on the sun has been formally measured since the middle of the 1700s. But there's measurements that go back to the ancient Mayas in South America. They go back to ancient China, where more uh, individual scientific measurements were done that are in the records, but they weren't done regularly. But still, you can plot back and discover that the number of sunspots matches up with the periods of global warming and the periods of global cooling. Indica and those sunspots indicate magnetic activity on the sun. The magnetic activity causes the magnetic shield around the earth to alter because of the interaction of the charged particles coming off the sun interacting with the earth. They in turn act as a screen, the, the magnetic field around the earth interacting now with the sun's field, called the, which is part of the solar wind, it's called, coming off the sun. It affects the screening of cosmic rays coming in from deep space. The cosmic rays coming in from deep space alter the cloud cover over Earth. Now, you only need the cloud cover to alter by a little bit, and the amount of heat that gets to the ground is altered. So less cloud allows more heat to get to the ground, so the ground warms up. More cloud screens, and so less heat gets to the ground, and the ground doesn't warm up. There's a much greater match, a much more reliable match between the magnetic activity of the sun and the amount of global warming or global cooling that we see. And that is totally natural. And that has been shown to have happened way back in time for thousands of years. Interestingly, if you look back in time, whenever there were periods of global warming, they coincided with health, welfare, and prosperity. Crops grew, uh, sea routes opened up, was ice melted, and so on. Passes over mountains opened up and people could cross from one town and one region to another. It's the periods of global cooling where crops failed, ice caused uh, trade routes to be uh, closed to humans, and so on. So, in fact, global warming has been beneficial. We also know that increased carbon dioxide leads to increased growth of green trees, green crops, and so on. There's improved crops. We can even measure now, in the last few years, there's been a greater greening of the earth as a result of the carbon dioxide increase that there has been, the thickness of the meat in the burger on the top of the Washington Monument. So say to yourself, what is going on? There's a hidden agenda at work. The people that want industry to be guilty are looking for a socialistic a way of resetting the earth. We hear about great resets and all such terminology. They are looking to exert power over how energy is produced, and therefore they also act against nuclear energy, for example, and say, right, if we can control energy, you can control industry. If you can control industry, you can reduce the number of motor cars made. You can reduce air conditioning that is produced. You can do control and cause the GDPs of countries to be put into low gear. This is just not honorable. And me, as a person coming from Africa, I feel particularly offended at times because there's many people in Africa that have no electricity and many that have very little electricity. And yet we find the first world telling Africans in Africa, stop advancing, stop using more electricity, don't do that. Do what is being done in Germany or elsewhere, put in wind and solar, which does not work for us and it doesn't work for them either. So I just say to people, think very carefully about this whole thing and say, what is really behind this whole business? There's more to it than meets the eye. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Now we're going to hear from Admiral Mark Pelias, retired Rear Admiral, U.S. Navy. His topic, a military perspective. 
Well, good morning. Uh, I regret that I will not be able to attend this conference, but I would like to frame the issues which should be part of the discussion, in my opinion. In previous conferences, as we've considered a very lofty goal of modern medical facilities available to all people, it became clear, at least to me, that we must first understand that there are some basic underlying problems which must be addressed in the world. In particular, access to water or clean and sanitary water uh, is fundamental. I believe that contaminated water supplies have been universally recognized as a prominent global issue. Uh, to put the, some things in perspective, just when we're talking about consumption, which is necessary for basic human life, at least 2 billion people around the world do not have access to a clean water supply. Every week, 30,000 people are estimated to die because of sickness deriving from unsafe water. 90% of these deaths are children under five years old, young children being the most affected by diseases in contaminated drinking water. The vast majority of these deaths occur in third world countries across the 54 countries of Africa, across Southeast Asia, and the continent of Latin America. In these countries, usually women and children are forced to spend approximately three hours a day walking, sometimes eight miles, to the nearest swamp or river, to bring back water that is often contaminated. Again, to put perspective on this, the time spent traveling to find water per year in Africa alone is estimated at 40 billion hours, which is equal to the entire workforce of France. Now, there are a host of organizations and companies that I've come across that are trying to address parts of the problem, but we are a long way from having a global plan to tackle this very real crisis. Frankly, the world is a bleak place for people who may not even own a spoon, who aren't educated on basic sanitation techniques much less having access to even the simplest technologies to purify water. Other organizations, such as the Gates Foundation and Charity Water, to name just two, are trying to address parts of the problem. So the challenge for this group is finding where we can may most effectively contribute. I know that for some 40 years, the Schiller Foundation or people involved in it have been looking at one major project across Africa called TransAqua, which would have the effect of making access to water for all uses, both industrial, um, uh, drinking water, um, et cetera, agricultural. Um, it's a long time in the making. Uh, this project would require, and I understand has the support of many of the affected governments uh, in, the, in the Central African region. 
So how do we decide where we can most effectively contribute? First, we must understand current efforts and technology. And uh, at the conclusion of the last conference that we held, uh, I suggested, and I suggest again, that a conference to examine both these current efforts and the technologies that are available or might be available to help alleviate this problem would be a very important endeavor. What I don't see for sure is a coordinated multinational effort to address access to water, access to clean water. And uh, perhaps we could effectively bring governments and NGOs together in a coordinated effort. Uh, again, it's very important to choose to choose the path that would be most effective, where you can have the greatest impact and long-term uh, help in solving this problem for the world. Uh, I believe that uh, solving access to water, clean water, clean drinking water, et cetera, is uh, truly above politics and can be a uniform unifying force for good. Uh, I wish you the best on your endeavors at this, and I trust subsequent conferences. Thank you. Yes, and thank you. Our next speaker is Alberto Vizcarra of Mexico. He's the director of the Citizens Movement for Water, and his topic is Binational Drought and the Binational Solution. Lo que caracteriza al clima es el cambio y los registros minerarios. What characterizes climate is change. Ancient records of sudden events in this regard go back to times when the cause of evolution had not yet made man's appearance on the planet possible. In primitive cultures, spreading fear of climate change and blaming human agro-industrial activity for this phenomenon was a means of control and submission. Similarly today, what lies behind the financial interests that are currently warning about a climate apocalypse is an intention to subject nations to their neo-colonial plans for deindustrialization, looting of natural resources, and population reduction. La humanidad es posible a pesar de lo que pregonan un armagedón climático. And yet, mankind is possible despite those who preach a coming climate Armageddon, which is tailor-made to their interests. It is with this in mind that we have to address the challenges that the climate poses to us and reassert the principle that human intelligence is the result of ecological evolution whose causal origin pose the need for a mind, noosphere, that understands the evolution of the universe in order to increase its potential for life. In light of these basic principles, we have to address the recurring drought cycles that occur in that vast expanse of territory shared by Mexico and the United States known as the Great American Desert. These episodes of drought have increased in intensity and even pose the danger of conflicts over the waters of the Colorado River and the Rio Grande, which the two countries share. Tensions have grown because the water consumption requirements over the last 50 years have significantly increased due to population growth and its concomitant needs. When the international boundary and water treaties were signed between Mexico and the United States in 1944, the existing population in the border states of the two nations was approximately 15 million people. Today, the population in the same region is estimated to exceed 100 million. A esta condición deficitaria. It was foreseeable that this shortfall situation would be reached 
worsened by the impact of drought episodes typical of a desert region. And the governments of the late 1950s and early 1960s, who were still thinking about the future, had warned about it. An old farmer from the Yaqui Valley, located in southern Sonora, Mexico, recounts that at the beginning of the 1960s, in a meeting they had with the Secretary of Hydraulic Resources of the government of President Adolfo López Mateos, he told them, to underscore the importance that the U.S. was giving to food production, that the U.S. government was planning to build a large water management project which would use the vast runoffs of the mighty rivers of Alaska and Canada and transfer them to the Great Plains of the Great American Desert. The same farmer said that the food producers were astonished by what they heard and that the Mexican official had answered optimistically. Since the harnessing of the atom was achieved, there are no limits to growth. The Mexican government official was referring to the North American Water and Power Alliance, NOAPA. Back then, Mexico was sharing common goals with the United States in the task of promoting water infrastructure in order to provide huge quantities of fresh water that would allow the greening of the desert with an expansion of land under cultivation and with extensive reforestation programs. This would allow the region of the Great American Desert to stop being a cloud-dissipating mirror to become instead an area that generates columns of humidity that help improve the climate and increase rainfall. Sobre la costa del Pacífico se impulsaba el plan hidráulico del noroeste, Plino. Within Mexico, the Northwest Hydraulic Plan, or Plino, was being promoted for the Pacific Coast, a project designed to transfer large quantities of water northward from the middle part of the state of Nayarit, where rainfall is three times greater than the south of the state of Sonora, and increase the land under cultivation in the states of Nayarit, Sinaloa, and Sonora by a million hectares. The Plino and Nahuapa would be linked via one of the three branches of the Nahuapa project that reaches the Agua Prieta River Basin, which is a tributary of the Yaqui River on the Sonora border. Thus, the two hydraulic projects would be connected in a single water management system, and the treaties would not be settling conflicts over insufficient water, but would manage the distribution of the new abundant resources available. As the Mexican government official of the López Mateos presidency recognized back in the 1960s, there is no technological or scientific constraint preventing Mexico and the United States from carrying out these water and energy management projects and thereby redefine a new platform for economic growth centered on the requirements of helping to alleviate hunger in the world by significantly increasing the production of basic grains. El actual gobierno de México, los gobernantes de los estados de la costa del Pacífico. The current government of Mexico and the governors of the states of the Mexican Pacific Coast must raise this discussion with the government of the United States and they must present it to the world, especially to nations like China, whose commitment to the construction of hydraulic infrastructure has earned them world leadership. Mexico must take advantage of the spirit of openness of the Chinese government, defined in its world program known as the Belt and Road Initiative, and bring to the table the importance of stimulating the economy of Mexico's Pacific Coast, especially given the great food potential of this region. This would be a win-win relationship. Mexico needs Chinese technology for the construction of the Plino, and China could make use of a large part of the food that could be produced with this project. La principal amenaza no son los cambios del clima. The main threat is not climate change. We are threatened by the custodians of a bankrupt international financial system who would use climate terror to impose an economy based on money and speculation. That is the real threat to humanity and to our nations. Thank you, Alberto Viscara. Our next speaker is Richard McPherson, retired U.S. Navy nuclear engineering officer. 
He was the United States representative on the International Atomic Energy Agency Six Nation Panel, panel following the Chernobyl accident. Uh, and his topic is the truth about nuclear power, ending war, beginning world development. My own point of view has been tempered by people um, that started in a nuclear program with nuclear reactors during the Manhattan Project. And I have been fortunate or unfortunate enough, depending on how you look at it, to be taught the history of all that by them. I have been part of it since 1963. The advantage, one of the biggest advantages I have is that I do not work for the government. I don't work for big business. I don't have to worry about a job, a paycheck, or getting advanced. I can talk about what is the best of the best that's available to us today. And for the needs of today, which in my opinion, is both domestically and internationally, what we would generally refer to as soft power, that all comes under the nexus of agriculture, water, and energy. But let's go back and talk about modular reactors and how we got to where we are today. So, the first modular reactor was the one that was built in Idaho between 1948 and 1953 for the first U.S. submarine, the USS Nautilus. Then Captain Rickover signed a contract in November of 1948 to design and build the first submarine reactor called S1W. S1W stands for Submarine First Corps Westinghouse. It went critical in March of 1953. Then the commercial side began. The commercial side began with a shipping port reactor that was not so much a modular design, more of it was built in place in shipping port between 1954 and 1957. By that time, the floodgates were opened and all the utilities had to have their own reactors. And there were, there were plenty of reactor suppliers to choose from because everybody wanted to design and build a nuclear reactor. Although most of the information came out of the Navy or the Manhattan Project. The first 1,000 megawatt reactor came about about 1970, and TVA built it. And um, I'm sorry, it was not 1970. It was 1970. No, it was 19. It was it was 1969. TVA built it, but TVA should have known how to build it because they built, they participated in building the first ones during the Manhattan Project. So fast forward to every utility had to have a reactor. They all started building their own, they all had a hand in them. And as a result, we had a whole bunch of one-off reactors. And the commercial industry was happy to provide them because they're paying for them. Along comes 1974 and things started changing. By 1974, the anti-nuclear community had put enough pressure on members of Congress to split up the Atomic Energy Commission into two parts. One became the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The other became, at the time, IRTA. Three years later, became the Department of Energy that we know today. Westinghouse recognized that everybody was making a mistake, including them, by not manufacturing modular reactors. What's a modular reactor? It's a modular reactor is something that's made in a manufacturing facility somewhere in the largest size possible that can be transported. Could be by truck, could be by rail, but it had to be a combination of the two generally, especially by truck for the last few miles or in later life, we built, we've built some special transporters. So the idea of a single reactor design, which we needed, a modular design we needed was born about 1975 in West Inhouse. And it was logical for them to do that because they'd been building reactors for the Navy since they signed that first contract in 1948 with Admiral Rickover. At the time, I was in the U.S. Navy, 
but at the time is when I first got associated with the American Nuclear Society section in San Diego. So my association with the commercial side of nuclear power started in 1975. All of us were enamored with the idea that Westinghouse would come up with a single design, a modular design, 600 megawatt design, and now we're going to see what was happening in the 70s con continue. A number of things happened in the late 1960s and early 1970s that changed things. The first thing that we saw, we saw from 1957 on and got a lot of growth in the late 60s, 10 years later, was the changes in public policy that had to do with the environment. We saw the Clean Water Act. We saw the Clean Air Act. Then we saw what was intended for the government only, the 1969, commonly called the 1970 NEPA Act, National Environmental Policy Act. That coupled with breaking up the AEC started putting a burden on building new nuclear power plants. Westinghouse was not selling any AP1, AP600s, the modular reactor. Then in 1979, two things happened, which helped burden down the commercial nuclear power industry from the new burdens that it had of the NRC and all the new environmental rules. And that was, there was a movie came out called Three Mile Island. I mean, excuse me, called uh, The China Syndrome. Right after it came out was Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island was a valve that was stuck in the open position um, in a pressurized water reactor. One of my current partners was just coming on watch in the morning when it was happening. He comes in the control room. He looks around. He says, I'm not relieving you until you find out what's going on. So we know all about TMI. I was back there that week. In a meeting after I'd been down there a couple of days, one evening in a hotel room, everybody's asking around as to what do they think? Well, here were my words and the place got instantly quiet. I said, this is really a good deal. Dead silence and now a whole bunch of senior people are looking at me. I said, the reason it's a good deal is because what we're going to find out is that all of our physics calculations and other calculations are so conservative that nothing really is going to happen except we're going to have a ruined reactor and it's all going to stay inside the pressure vessel. Bottom line, in the long run, that's exactly what happened. There was nobody hurt. Nobody got hurt any kind of damage at all, despite all the reports of the contrary. But the combination of things that occurred with changes in public policy starting in 1957 that really got its biggest push around 1970, coupled with Three Mile Island and the movie China Syndrome was the beginning of the end for the commercial nuclear power industry in the United States. So for a period of about 20 years, General Electric tried to sell the AP-600. In 1993, I'm not sorry, General Electric Westinghouse. Westinghouse decided, well, the reason that we can't sell them is they're only 600 megawatts. They need to be 1,000 megawatts. So they came up with the AP-1000. Instantly, the AP-600 became a 1,000 megawatt reactor couple of years, almost three years go by and they can't sell it. So now they're talking to people in the industry. British Nuclear Fuels decided to buy Westinghouse and the nuclear division. And they started working with a company in Idaho and together it was public knowledge that Morrison Knudsen and British Nuclear Fuels were gonna buy Westinghouse nuclear. I knew senior people at both companies. I called me a guy I knew in BFNL. I called somebody I knew at Morrison Knutson. I told them basically the same thing. 
you're, you're, you're trying to buy this company thinking you're going to save your own companies. And it's not going to happen in either case. Both people, not, they don't even know each other. They assured me that senior management knew what they were doing. So the deal was consummated. And now Westinghouse belonged to BNFL and Morrison Knutson headquartered in the UK. Time passes and now 2000, we're now 2006, a decade later. Suddenly Toshiba starts making noise about buying Westinghouse. Something about that didn't make sense to me. They bought Westinghouse. Six months later, it was announced that China had a contract with Toshiba to buy a couple of AP-1000 reactors. There was a great loss of American technology paid for by taxpayers, ratepayers, and investors that went to China starting in 2006. China had already pre-positioned people over here, Americans, recruiting to have them come to China to work on the design, the manufacturing and construction of the AP-1000s in China. A friend of mine took a team over there for five years. Afterwards, he told me he made a mistake, but none of them knew it. The, e the, the reason that China was so, it was so easy for China to entice them to come over was because there was no work for them in the United States. They were paying them well. They're letting them work in their chosen field. And people who had 10, 20, 30 years plus of experience went to China. So it's not just a case of a simple technology transfer from Toshiba and Westinghouse to China. They got the knowledge of thousands of Americans that went over there to work. We should fast forward to today. The situation today is dire. We have seen over the past less than a decade, the morphine of large reactors, the AP-1000s, because we went to build, everybody was happy in 2010. We're gonna build four AP-1000s in the United States. Two of them are gonna be built in Georgia. Two of them are gonna be built in South Carolina. Everybody was happy. Everybody was patting on each other's back about the nuclear renaissance. Okay, I had doubts, a bunch of us had doubts. Our doubts unfortunately turned into reality. The days of us building a bunch of large reactors is pretty much over. Too complex, too much time, too much money. There was a resurgence in looking at small modular reactors. First, they're called small modular reactors because they're less than 300 megawatts, which is a term that comes out of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, Austria. If they're between 60 to 300 megawatts, they're called a small modular reactor. Smaller than that, they're called a micro reactor. In 2000, Dr. Jose Riaz was at Oregon State University. And he got some money from the Department of Energy to design a small modular reactor. In 2007, he and someone else formed a company that we now know as New Scale Power in Corvallis, Oregon. They continued on with the design of that small modular reactor. And it's now towards the last of its time with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and they anticipate the first one will be built for a company called UAMPS, Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems, in, 19, in 2029 and 2030 at the Idaho National Laboratory here in Idaho. Other people have jumped on the bandwagon and have small modular reactors. Uh, General Electric has one. Westinghouse is trying to have one. Babcock and Wilcox tried to have one. Then along came more experienced people in actually designing and building nuclear plants. And they've come up with small, what we call micro reactors. One of them is a Dr. Paul Murata, 
who was a designer at Naval Reactors for many years at Kaplan, upstate New York. There were no new designs for the Navy, and he was bored, so he quit and went on his own. He knew what was needed, and it was a, and it was a micro-reactor. It was a micro-reactor based upon technology that we already know about called molten salt. He calls it the molten salt nuclear battery. You'll be able to put it in the ground, turn it on, and it gives you 10 megawatts for 10 years. We have seen the small modular reactors as we know them being slowed down by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and other people in this country. They may try to do the same thing with the micro reactors. The problem is the micro reactors are so simple, so safe, that we're going to see an evolution of small micro of the of the micro reactors before we're going to see the small modular reactors. I know the new scale design very well because I was hired to be to bring in a team and be part of the team that did all of their design one reviews. I get involved with almost everybody's reactors one way or another. So I know what people are doing. I know about the technology. But I've also been involved in national security since 1973, 63 rather. And I re represented the United States for four years at the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, Austria, because of the Chernobyl accident. Because of the Chernobyl accident, the Soviets went to Hans Blix in 1987. And they said, our people don't trust us. Hans Blix, who was Secretary General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, went to Washington and said, I need your help. We need to do something. And here's an opportunity. So the United States funded a six nation group be put together. The nations were the United States, the UK, Spain, Soviet Union, Canada, and Switzerland. I was picked to be the United States representative. Our assigned task was to study nuclear fuel cycle facilities, the environment and public opinion as one subject. For all of us that were there, nuclear fuel cycle facilities was very easy. The environment was pretty easy also because the International Atomic Energy Agency had already done so much work at looking at everything to do with the environment. Public opinion is where we actually spent more than 50% of our time and money and travels. Because public opinion is what's caused us not to have what President Eisenhower offered in 1953. President Eisenhower offered the world U.S. nuclear technology for prosperity and security for the world. We should all be enjoying that worldwide now. We should not have 800 million people without electricity and water. We should not have 2 billion people going hungry at night around the world. There is absolutely no technical, technical reason why. It is all political. It is all greed. It is all people trying to have power over other people. Technology-wise, there is no reason why everybody in this world doesn't have clean water, doesn't have food, doesn't have basic medicines, doesn't have enough energy to do all the above, plus make some sort of a living and have security. Since I went back to work in 2016, I've decided to devote my life to soft power and problems under the nexus of agriculture, water, and energy. I know firsthand the solution, I knew doing that firsthand the solutions are out there. Thank you, Richard McPherson. Let me just say that uh, many of the people from our panel are on uh, and we wanna get to the discussion as quickly as we can. We have two other presentations, and we intend to reach the discussion just uh, after the top of the hour. That means in about 28 to 30 minutes. Uh, and at that point, we're going to bring everybody up on screen. If you have questions and you want to get them answered, then you should begin uh, writing them. You can do that at questions at schillerinstitute.org, which is at the bottom of your page. Uh, now what I want to do is go to our next speaker, who is Vincenzo Romanello. Dr. Vincenzo Romanello is a nuclear engineer. He's the founder of uh, Atoms for Peace. 
He's uh, coming to us from the Czech Republic, and his topic is Building a Nuclear Power Platform for the World. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Vincenzo Romanello. I'm a PhD, and I'm a nuclear engineer and nuclear researcher. I'm currently the president of Atomi per la Pace, which is an Italian pro-nuclear no-profit association. Today, I'm going to present um, some slides about the perspectives of nuclear energy applications in the world energy mix. So let's come to the history of energy. The first milestone started when mankind start, started to exploit fire. The per capita energy rises to 1,100,000 calories per year. Then the second milestone happened when agriculture was discovered and then per capita energy need rise, rise again to 4,500,000 calories per year. Third milestone when metallurgy was discovered in 4,000 before Christ. The fourth milestone was when water mill was mentioned by Antipater of Thessalonica in the first century be, um, before Christ. Fifth milestone when Arabs introduced the windmill technology around 650 after death. Sixth milestone in uh, the 14th century in Europe when gunpowder was used as the first artificial form of energy especially for war applications. Seventh, mi seventh milestone when uh, in the 17th century when coal was introduced in industrial production and then per capita energy need experienced the steep increase from 5 million to 15 calories, 15 million calories per year. Eighth milestone started when uh, the crude oil use uh, began to be used in, uh, in the industry since the mid uh, of the 19th century and the start of the Industrial Revolution. And this also was the start of the, of the steep population growth, as I will show in a moment. The Nine Milestone happened on December the 2nd in 1942, when Enrico Fermi started the first nuclear reaction chain in history in the Chicago pile. The per capita energy needed, needed settled to 35 a million calories per year. And the time, 10th milestone it is, was still not reached, but it will probably take place when nuclear fusion will be a commercially available source. So what energy consumption means exactly? This is a map which shows the energy use in 2013 in terms of oil equivalent per capita. And here on the right up, we have the child mortality rate, and right down we have the expect life expectancy, average life expectancy. It is rather impressive from my point of view how these maps are very similar and uh, can be overlapped somehow. So here we see the world population versus year, starting from year 1000, when the mankind population was around half a billion inhabitants. And then we see a steep increase after the Industrial Revolution at the mid of the 19th century. And uh, yes, in, in, the, in the beginning of the 19th century, we were around 1 billion. They were almost 8 billion. And uh, there were some projections in 1970 what would be the population at the end of the present century with a constant uh, growth rate of 2.1%. And you can see we would be 55 billion. But the reality is that there was a linear decreasing rate. Today, the, the, the growth rate today is almost half of that was in 1970. And in fact, the red line is much more realistic and it shows that by the end of the century will be around 11 or 12 billion inhabitants. So it seems there isn't any population bomb, despite the success of the book of Paul Ehrlich in 1968. A lot of energy will be needed, and many think and state that we have renewable energies, so there are no problems. 
In order to conveniently exploit an energy source, however, it should be continuous, divisible, concentrated and redressable. In other words, if an energy source is discontinuous and dispersed, it could be still used, of course, but this would be paid with an increased technological complexity and cost. The key word for understanding this topic is power. As an example, if I get 100 watts per one hour, I will consume 100, 100 watt hours, which means 0.1 kilowatt hour, and I will be able to light, for example, 10 lamps for one hour, so my whole flat. But if I get one watt for 100 hours, I will still have 0.1 kilowatt hour energy, but I will not be able to light any bulb, any light, anything. It is very difficult and expensive to store efficiently large amounts of electric energy. And the renewable energies, in particular sun and wind, are provided for free, in fact, by nature and are practically endless. But collecting and exploiting them is not easy nor cheap at all. The point is that even if I have a proper number of solar panels on my roof, for example, I want to run my TV, my fridge or my oven, even if it is raining since three days or during night. And of course, there are no problems if the battery is the electric net, somebody else takes care of the energy produced and pays for it. And it works until there are a few users introducing variable power in the net, but it becomes definitely much more complex if every user starts to produce power randomly and introduces randomly in the net. The management of an electric net is not as easy as some people may think. Moreover, renewable energies, when not heavily subsidized, are rather expensive, especially when all the costs are properly taken into consideration. And according to some studies, example, like, for example, uh, Ferroni and Hopkirk in Energy Policy in 2016, solar panels are unable even to return the energy used for day fabrication. And we should keep in mind that in any case, a source of energy should be able to return at least five times the energy used for its fabrication, transport, management and dismantlement. Renewable energies, in particular wind, were used extensively in the past but when the world population was all, was circa one-tenth of that which is today. What about nuclear fusion, which is the hope of many people? But let's make some, some discussion about this. Why nuclear fusion would be important? Well, the deuterium in one liter, the, the heavy isotope of hydrogen, so in almost one-fourth of a U.S. gallon of ordinary water can produce the same amount of energy of 300 liters, which means almost 80 U.S. gallons of gasoline or half a ton of coal. And uh, the technology could feed the humanity energy needs for the next centuries for sure. And it does not produce long-lived nuclear waste like fission. Here we have heavy hydrogen, so deuterium, radioactive hydrogen, so very heavy isotope hydrogen with two neutrons, tritium, they react. And the results are a nucleus of helium, which is not toxic, which is an inert gas, and the neutron. And what is interesting here is that we develop with this, uh, in this reaction, 17.6 million electron volts. Electron volt is the uh, unit of measure of energy. And it's interesting to remember that out of this 17.6 MeV, only 3.5 go to helium and remain in the plasma, and 14.1 MeV go, go to the neutron under the form of a very penetrating neutron radiation, which escapes from plasma, of course. So we have to remember that the energy of fusion is not developed in the form of heat as conventional sources, as even nuclear fission does, but like neutron radiation, which is extremely penetrating, it is necessary first to stop this radiation, transform radiation in heat, then transfer this heat from to, to some water to warm up some water up to steam, run uh, some uh, turbine with this steam, and then uh, electricity generator. This is, should be the process, and of course, it's rather complex. But still, for comparison, 
two, uh, um, two molecules of hydrogen with oxygen, which produce water, so which burn chemically, produce 4.88, so less than 5 electron volts, which means that nuclear fusion is 3.6 times, million times more efficient than conventional chemical reactions. But it's not that easy, however, to, ex to exploit it, because first of all, temperatures required for DT reaction, so deuterium tritium reaction, are of the order 100 million Kelvin degrees. And for comparison, the temperature of the center of the sun is only 15 million degrees. And of course, there are no materials which can withstand this kind of temperatures. So a couple of technologies are possible. One is based on magnetic confinement, which is ITER, uh, the facility built in the south of France in Cadarache, and uh, the inertial confinement in the National Ignition Facility in Lawrence Livermore are two different approaches, however, uh, respecting the so-called laws and criterion. So in one, you try to confine the plasma at low density for a long time, which is the magnetic confinement. In the other one, you try to confine the plasma for a short time, but very high density. In any case, they are both rather complex and expensive technologies still to be developed and proven. And uh, of course, also a consistent amount of activated materials are produced as well uh, due, to due to intense neutronic field, which is produced. Of course, if you add the neutron to a stable uh, material, it becomes an isotope, often radioactive. Tritium does not exist in nature, and this is for a very simple reason. Tritium is radioactive, and its half-life is around 12 years. So every 12 years, half of tritium decays. You cannot store it for a very long time and very efficiently. So it has to be produced artificially, and this happens by neutron capture in lithium. And we have to remember that it's radioactive uh, substance, it's toxic, and it can easily contaminate uh, water because it, it behaves chemically like hydrogen. So half of the energy uh, as tritium comes from lithium actually comes from this metal. And lithium is an abundant metal on the crust, uh, earth crust, but its price is already fast increasing due to battery applications and we have to remember that on the contrary on, uh, on what happens with uranium for example, lithium has also other applications, like for example, in some, some drugs. <clears throat> Nobody really knows, by the way, what does it mean that uh, mankind hungry for energy is burning water by nuclear transmutation, which means this water disappears forever. It's a very tiny amount of water. It's only the heavy water, which is one part every 6,000 parts. But still, it's nuclear transmutating forever. And the fusion technology when it will become commercially mature, and it will take some decades more, we have to prove also to be economically convenient and competitive with other energy sources, and this will take still more time. In my opinion, it is unrealistic to expect to have fusion reactors able to provide electric power in the net at commercial prices before the end of the present century. So, then, what we should do, what we are supposed to do, We have an abundant, reliable, and economically convenient source of energy. It is nuclear fission. One kilogram of uranium oxide, which is the fuel used in current light water reactors, so uh, volume of the size of a small apple with a six centimeter diameter, produces today in a reactor, in a light water reactor, 50 megawatt day, which means 50 million watts per one day which means 1,200,000 kilowatt hour, which is enough to supply energy for one year to 200 houses and families, for example. And assuming a cost of $1,000 per kilogram on a rich uranium oxide, which can be even less, but let's take this number just for an example, it would imply a cost of fuel of the order of less than one cent per kilowatt hour. Of course, the price of nuclear energy does not depend on the price of uranium, which is only a tiny part. I calculated that, for example, that even if the price of uranium is multiplied by a factor of three, 
the increase in the energy, nuclear energy price would be only of the order of 16%, because the price of uranium was only a tiny part of the cost of the, of the energy. The majority of the cost comes from the fabrication of the plant. However, today, a reasonable price for kilowatt hour, nuclear kilowatt hour, is of the order in, in, the, in the interval between three and seven cents per kilowatt hour. This depends on many factors, which I cannot discuss here. And we have enough uranium to satisfy reliably the energy needs of the mankind for at least one century. But I will come back to this point in a moment, in the next slides. Nuclear waste can be safely stored in geological repositories and in any case reprocessing and transmutation technologies can lighten fire addition. There is not enough information you know, around for the public about transmutation, but there are companies which are running these technologies. A lot of scientists working on transmutation of nuclear waste. Um, there are projects and uh, designs of new reactors, of new machines. There should be something that should be explored more in detail. Therefore, from my point of view, nuclear fusion should be considered at least as a bridge technology toward the fusion, fusion energy. We're going to conclude uh, Mr. Romanello's presentation at this point, mainly because we've got to get to discussion. He's also with us, and we've already gotten three or four questions for him specifically about this presentation. The entire presentation will be available at the Schiller Institute site. And we're now going to go to John Shanahan, a civil engineer who is the, also the editor of AllAboutEnergy.net. And his topic is Stand Up for the Truth. Fossil fuels are good. Nuclear energy is good. Progress is good. Hi, I'm John Shanahan. I'm a civil engineer in Denver, Colorado. I would like to thank the Schiller Institute for inviting me to give this short presentation about energy and related issues of climate change. In my career, I've traveled the world, spent 11 years living in Europe, traveled to Asia, South, South America, and uh, I've gotten to have contacts with people in 124 countries. In 2021, uh, North America and Europe in particular, but the world as a whole, faces many choices. We have choices on our energy sources, what kind of lifestyle we want to aim for, on the environment, on our education systems, and on governments that guide us. This talk was inspired by colleagues in the nuclear industry, particularly colleagues that tell us that nuclear power can solve the so-called challenges of climate change. As a civil engineer has worked in the nuclear industry uh, for 25 years and worked another 25 years as a promoter for nuclear power, I've studied both fossil fuels and nuclear power, and I feel that I know quite a bit about the challenges we face. The world is going in two different directions, and my nuclear colleagues at many nuclear organizations, international nuclear organizations, and websites all over the world are advertising, are claiming that nuclear power can solve a so-called anthropogenic or man-made global warming crisis that is coming up in the next 10 years. I respectfully disagree and my purpose is to guide those colleagues uh, to what I think is a better direction for nuclear power, one that will help them succeed. And that is uh, the founding uh, engineer for nuclear power in the United States. The founding civilian nuclear engineer, Ted Rockwell, said in about 2011 in testimony to Congress that nuclear power advocates should not claim that nuclear power 
can solve so-called man-made global warming crises, but rather that nuclear power, and this is really true, nuclear power can help mankind deal with all natural climate change that happens. And if my nuclear colleagues would switch from their claims about uh, helping solve a climate crisis to helping mankind deal with all climate crises, uh, we would be on the right track and make a lot of progress going forward. How many of us appreciate fossil fuels and fossil fuel byproducts? I do. I appreciate them tremendously. Fossil fuels have created the modern world of the last 120 years, taken us from a terrible world before fossil fuels to the world we have today. Every time I go and fill up my car with gas so I know I can travel anywhere I want for 300 miles, 400 miles, anytime I go to the grocery store, get any product I want so that I don't have to make it myself, uh, that's all due to fossil fuels. And I have that appreciation. Uh, there are a lot of people that take that for granted while they uh, sound the alarm about man-made climate change, man-made global warming, and that yet they use their cars, they go to the stores. That's another group of people. And then the third group of people are activists, extremists, who are taking actions to have the world stop using fossil fuels, demand they stop using fossil fuels. People in government at the city, state, and federal level that are taking actions to stop using fossil fuels and impose uh, wind and solar on us. One direction, support fossil fuels and nuclear, and the other direction, support wind and solar and the governors that promote uh, man-made global warming. One direction will lead us in the right way, the other will lead us to a catastrophe, I feel, that would be worse than any catastrophe, any health plague that we've ever faced in the past. There are several types of governments in the world today. Two of them have to do with the free world, and the third type of government have to do with dictator governments. The first kind in the free world is the kind of governments that are announcing alarmism for carbon dioxide, the molecule of life, that the molecule that enables all plants to grow and all plants feed all animals and all humans. So it's the molecule of life. And they claim that the growth in atmospheric carbon dioxide in the last 120 years is leading to uh, uh, a worldwide disaster. And they claim that they need to impose fo uh, wind and solar. They need to uh, demand that the world stop using fossil fuels. I would like to show you one graph that we all can understand immediately. It's not complicated and it tells the whole story. This graph shows what energy we use based on 100%. It's, it's uh, uh, made without reference to units, just 100%. And it covers the last uh, 50 or 100 years. The graph, so the graph shows, it's, it's, it shows 100% of the energy used in each year. And black is fossil fuels. Gray, light gray, is nuclear power. Blue is hydropower. And green is wind and solar. And if you look at the graph, you see the entire picture is dominated by over 80% of the top half of the graph, top part of the graph, is black. Fossil fuels provide 
80% of the world's energy. That's energy for electricity, but also, and most importantly, for transportation and heavy industry. Then you see that nuclear power has grown to a certain percentage, small percentage. Hydroelectric has also grown as we could build dams. And wind and solar are just a sliver. All right. So we are now going to go to questions. What we want to do is bring up the various uh, members of our panel that are with us. Uh, and I think we're going to bring them all up on screen right now. Uh, and I'll uh, wait until I see everybody so I can say who we have. All right, let's see. I see Alberto Viscara. Welcome. I see, hi, I see Colonel Walter Faggett. He's there. Okay. And uh, Richard McPherson's there. Uh, Vincenzo Romanello is there. That's good. Uh, Dr. Calvin Kim, where it is now, what is it, almost 11, 8, 11 p.m. And, of course, it's 10 p.m. for, how are you? How are you? Uh, and Major General Peter Clegg is there. Uh, and, of course, Helga Sepp-Labrouche is there. So let me uh, first ask Helga if she has any response to what she's heard or anything she'd like to say and comment. And then from there, we'll uh, begin the discussion, both among the panel, and then there's already several questions that we will direct towards certain individuals. So, Helga? I want to thank all of the speakers who all brought one aspect or another of a very, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, challenging picture. I mean, we have to somehow make sure that, that uh, science gets, um, you know, back into the picture and not ideology and money. All right. Uh, anybody have anything in particular that they feel that they need to say before we get started? Okay, Mr. McPherson, go ahead. It was. Uh, hold on. Hey, Richard, you're it's muted, I believe. I was particularly struck by comments by uh, uh, Kelvin Kim and, uh, and uh, the Admiral. And then Alberto Vizcara talked about Mexico and talked about bringing water from up north. Um, in 2004, I was invited to Sonora, Mexico, to a NAFTA meeting on fruits and vegetables. And I was asked to give a talk on the future of energy for agriculture. My talk there was um, pretty clear about energy overall. But I was asked also about the water issues that were looming for the Western United States in Sonora, Mexico. And I was introduced to a project that had been languishing in Sonora for many years to put a nuclear power plant down in Sonora and desalinate water and send it around Sonora and also send it north to uh, Arizona and put it into the Miss, Missouri, excuse me, the Colorado River and also make it available to the Central Arizona Project. I have been off and on involved with that ever since 2004. People just can't seem to get themselves organized to work together to do something like that. <clears throat> and the Admiral talked about that a little bit. Um, Dr. Kim talked about Africa. There's a lot of people don't, don't know much about Africa. There's plenty of water in Africa. Africa is basically 4,000 miles wide and 4,000 miles long. There's absolutely no reason why we don't have a distribution center for water in Africa using nuclear power. Today, with the advent of microreactors, we could do that very easily. And I do not see any reason at all why the world doesn't get together and start working on that in Africa, as we should all the way on the west coast of North America, from Alaska all the way down into Mexico. 
Those are my general comments. Thank you. Let me just ask Dr. Kim if he has any response to you, and then I'm going to ask Helga if he <clears> may <throat> want to have something to say about the Transaqua project, which uh, is in re- of some relevance here. Dr. Kim? Well, I entirely agree with what Richard says, and also to link it to what Helga says. Helga says, bring science back, start leaving in science. It was interesting earlier that we heard about the amount of money spent on the um, the public understanding of what's going on. And I think that is a very major problem that we find that you get debates on things like nuclear power and you get professionals in the field who know what they're talking about, people of years of experience, but they come up against the florist and the baker and the hairdresser and so on, uh, who are all well and good in their fields. But then the anti-nuclear lobby and the extreme green lobby come along and say, well, everybody's entitled to an opinion. Now, it's true that everybody's entitled to an opinion, but you're not entitled to argue with professionals when they tell you something. And this is why some of the frustration that one sees about wind and solar and so on, and all the speakers have spoken with very similar messages, that uh, people say, oh, we just put batteries in. And imagine that some little battery is just going to keep you running all night. and so on. (laughs) It's not going to. We've got to look towards Africa and say, as we expand in Africa, let's not expand the wrong uh, philosophies, let's get it right. And right means small modular reactors and the micro reactors, and I agree entirely, and uh, pumping water from one place to another, which can be done one place to another, I mean in many kilometers, hundreds of kilometers, that can be done. Here in Pretoria, where I am, we are 600 kilometers from the coast, um, but the oil refinery down there pumps petrol and diesel underground 600 kilometers from the coast and it comes out here. You know, this type of thing is done. There's gas pipelines from Mozambique into South Africa. So imagining long pipelines, water distribution in a large scale, get the engineers who know what they're talking about, get the professionals who know what they're talking about and do this thing properly, not from demonstrators in the streets waving placards. Hmm. Uh, Helga, you have any comment? Well, I mean, since you you mentioned Transaqua, I I think that this is a project we have been fighting for for 30 years. And now it's basically ready to go because there was a big conference in Ajuba uh, last year and the six countries of the uh, basin, the chart uh, basin uh, unreiners countries, they all agreed to go for it. And there is a, a feasibility study underway from the Italian side. So I think, you know, what we actually need to is to really get, uh, you know, going on this question of taking care of the water uh, for 2 billion people on the planet. And Transaqua would be one of the major projects uh, to refill the lake chart, to give uh, irrigation water to 12 countries between the Congo River and the Lake Chad region. So I think there is absolutely no reason why this project should not go uh, you know, into action right away. And the same goes for many projects, you know. I mean, I think, I mean, the problem is really a political one because there are certain forces linked to the big money in the city of London and also Wall Street who are betting on the Green Deal and the, you know, new Green Deal, new, uh, new, a Green New Deal, which is all, you know, it's, 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 it's going to be the end of the industrial nations as industrial nations. So I think we are really at, a, at an emergency point. And, you know, I think the fact that all of these crises are coming together, the water uh, the heavy rain of causing floods, which could have been prevented, you know, the pandemic not being under control, uh, the clear recognition that the endless wars have not really resulted even in, in serving American interest, if you would define it, you know, as, a, as an American interest. I think we need to get a discussion that there needs to be a complete change of the axioms. And in my view, it starts with the image of man. Man is the, you know, the most advanced part of the universe. The, the ideas generated by human creativity 
discovering discovering scientific uh, principles of the physical universe that is the the most advanced part of the evolution of the universe because if there would not be a correspondence between what the human mind creates and the laws of the universe it would not function so this is the simple proof you know that the human mind and the laws of the universe are coherent and we need to have a discussion you know which appreciates men you know as my late husband said at the very beginning of the first panel you know that is what differentiates us from the beasts and we are not a parasite we are not a burden to nature and i think we need to have a fundamental discussion about that difference because all the other things you know the environmentalism the money greed all of this flows out of the image of man at least that is my humble opinion all right um, there's a set of various kinds of questions, plus there's also a question of cross-discussion in the panel. So partially because I want to make sure that those who are six <coughs> and seven hours out there uh, get a chance to uh, answer while they're still awake. Uh, I've got a question for you, Dr. Romanello. Uh, uh, this comes from uh, one of our people here. Uh, uh, Dr. Romanello, you're... Uh, presentation was incredibly clear and concise. I very much enjoyed it. it. In your presentation, you mentioned that the development of thermonuclear fusion is not as easy as we, we may want it to be. For example, you mentioned the fact that tritium is not produced in nature and must be produced artificially with lithium, which is already increasing in price due to its frequent use in batteries. Do you think this problem can be resolved with the use of helium-3? Uh, although it isn't abundant on Earth, it can be mined on the moon and act as a replacement fuel for tritium, which would waste less energy and be much easier to contain. Other than that, how else can we speed up the development of thermonuclear fusion to replace fission eventually in the global economy? That's the question for you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So... Uh, there is actually another opportunity which is being explored in this period, which is uh, thermonuclear fusion with helium-3. And this is very interesting because this kind of fusion does not produce neutrons. And so it is very clean. <laughs> but there are two problems. First, we do not have helium-3 on the Earth. We have to go to the moon to take it. Of course, we can go to the moon, take enough helium-3, and uh, run a country like China for one year. But this is a very futuristic project, first fact. Second fact, the temperature needed for this kind of uh, reaction is much higher than DT reaction, which is already eight times the temperature of the sun. So, yes, interesting scientific, from the scientific point of view, but not that easy to achieve. Of course, it's good that we pursue the research in this field, but it will not come to uh, electricity the net in the next time. So I need that fusion. It's a very interesting technology, very important technology. We have to pursue with research on it. We have to put a lot of money and of, of good ideas on it. But for sure, whatever we do, we will not have a fusion reactor in the next years. We will have to improve our technology with fission and use fission as a bridge technology, as I stated in my presentation. Um, I have anybody else on the panel want to respond to that? Or, okay. So uh, I have a question which is directed to you, Helga. Well, it's actually to you and to others, but um, it says, thank you for a very interesting panel, especially the first panel. I liked Professor Franco uh, Francesco Battaglia and his rejection uh, to subscribing to any authority, to subscribing any authority to the notion of a carbon footprint. We should not move to a fission fusion based economy because it is carbon neutral. We would be embracing a fallacy of composition, which ultimately equals a self defeating pessimism. A few years ago, I encountered Shellen Huber at a Berlin presentation uh, to an audience of mostly academics. The audience were more angry at me than Shellen Huber himself for publicly publicly challenging his genocidal plan for the plans for the world. Um, I had challenged their hero, the great defender of their worldview of an entropic universe. So my question to Helga 
or anybody else really is, behind the mask of ecology and green are simply, are we simply just facing the good old enemy of cultural pessimism? And if so, are we not becoming enslaved by that paradigm? And is the only remedy not a cultural, uh, uh, not a cultural upshift through rapid economic development on a worldwide basis to break out of this cultural stranglehold? That's basically the question. So it's directed to you, Helga, and then anybody else. <clears throat> well, I think behind that pessimism is the oligarchy. <clears throat> uh, and very concretely, uh, Schellenhuber, <clears throat> uh, who used to be the head of the Potsdam Climate Consequence uh, fo uh, Follow, uh, co Consequences Following Out of Climate Policy, uh, insists that he be called Sir. Uh, commander of the British Emba Empire, C CBE. And, you know, he has been knighted by Queen Elizabeth in, I think it was 2015. I may be mistaken, I may have been earlier. But in any case, you know, he is just absolutely carrying out the um, colonial imperial policy of the British royal household. And you know, if you if we have published papers about that a lot, if you look at the history of environmentalism, it started really with Maltus. It started with the British East India Company, with the various forms of British um, conservative uh, cons conservationist movements around the turn of the twenty, the nineties to the twentieth century. It was carried on by the. Uh, <clears throat> Basically, the policy of uh, racism in in the in the Nazi period, and then it was because it was discredited. Uh, what happened in in Nazi Germany? It was then called uh, uh, again conservationist policy and became the environmentalist policy. But it's a long tradition of keeping the world population reduced to have an oligarchical elite. Uh, in the past, it was mainly monarchies and high nobility, uh, people who think that there are some better species. Read the letters of uh, John de Maistre, uh, you know, to a Prussian, uh, to a Russian prince. He, he lays it all out there. And, you know, to nowadays, it's the financial elite. It's people who think that they have the right to have privileges at the expense of large masses of backward people. So if you scratch a little bit below the surface, you know, what comes out is really an ideology to keep the masses of people down at the at the advantage of a small elite. And, you know, I think that that is the main problem that people don't understand that, for example, they have built a network of uh, cluster agents in the me mass media. Um, for example, in Germany, the media is almost entirely controlled. When you listen to the news, there is not one news item which doesn't have a spin in the direction of green, climate change, climate catastrophe. Uh, it's a form of brainwashing. And I think people have to understand that unless you attack this political fight, um, you know, this is not going to be won. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to respond? And also, by the way, I got to remember that Major General Peter Clegg hasn't spoken yet. So just wanted to warn you, I'm going to be asking you if you have anything to say, General. Uh, okay, if no one else is going to respond to that per se, uh, we'll come back to uh, General <laughs> Clegg. And I have one question, which was again uh, for... Uh, Dr. Romanello. And this question had to do with, I'm trying to find it here, so excuse me. Oh, yeah. This is about something you said about fusion, and someone had a question about the containment question, container vessels. You said, you seem to say that no container, containment vessel can hold 100 million degrees. How does the magnetic field, how does the magnetic field project the, protect the container uh, from the reaction? Why do we need 100 million degrees here if the sun only needs 15 million? Why is that needed for fusion? 
Well, the fusion which uh, happens into the sun is uh, is the different type of fusion that uses different type of isotopes. The most viable way in the Earth was decided to, that is uh, uh, deuterium and tritium, and deuterium and tritium uses needs really one one hundred million uh, degrees Kelvin. And in any case, it would not be different if we would need also 10 million degrees. It would be the same. There are no materials able to withstand these kind of temperatures. So we can only do one, one simple thing, use a magnetic field to confine it. And obviously, it's not a simple magnetic field. It's a very complex magnetic field with some torsion in a, in a toroidal situation, in a, in a very special configuration. And of course, it uses superconducting materials. So you have very low temperatures in the conductors, and in few meters you have a million degrees. It's a complex technology. And moreover, you have also to recover the ashes, practically, of the reaction with a special component, which is called diverter. Diverter has a very high heat flux, which is extremely difficult to handle. There are very technical points that you, I should take me a whole presentation to explain which are the critical points of fusion, but they are certainly not uh, easy to withstand. They are trying, ITER, they are trying, and uh, they will try to start the deuterium tritium fusion in, in 2035, if I remember correctly. But then they will only make, uh, we have only to remember that ITER will be a gigantic physics experiment. No electricity will be put on the net. So when we will show around the half of this century that uh, that fusion is feasible technically we will have to design a reactor which is commercially available and feasible and uh, and convenient and this will take place and i'm not even sure it is uh, even possible to do this because the complex is very the technology is very very complex and it will take time okay so what I'd like to do, I have a question which is actually going to involve a few people who are here. Uh, but uh, uh, General Clegg, is there anything that you'd like to say at this point? First of all, I, I am tremendously impressed by all the presentations that I've heard today. I think they've all been excellent. It's been a very worthwhile session to hear all this. And I come out with uh, a positive and a negative observation. The positive observation is that, as has been stated, we have the technology to make such a dent in all these problems. Uh, and so the reasons for the world's <laughs> failure to get together and solve some of these problems is not technological. Uh, the reasons are essentially political. Um, that's meant as a positive comment. The, the negative comment is has to do, so on the one hand, we've seen what the scientific community has given us. It has given us answers. It has given us the ability to deal with a lot of these problems. Now on the negative side, what we have seen today, which is disturbing to me, is the politiz politization of the scientific community. Everybody says we got to look at the science. We got to do it. All the politicians are now saying that, and of course, they're the last ones who look at the science. <laughs> but the problem with the politi politicization—I can't uh, get my words out properly here—is that ninety, perhaps even ninety-five, ninety-eight percent of the scientific, the quote large scientific community, doesn't know anything about these specific issues that we're talking about. Scientists are great in their field, and they're experts in their field. They make contributions in their field, but they don't know about the wide scope of science. So the opinions of the 95% of the scientific community that we hear about aren't worth any more than anybody else's opinion on many of these questions. They're just as ignorant as the rest of us are. And this observation is gets back to the fact that so many people are lemmings um, we hear that the quote the scientific consensus well first of all there is no scientific consensus on a lot of these questions and i can think back uh, to the 1970s uh, one of the speakers mentioned the co global cooling that took place in the 1970s well 
Global cooling at that time was viewed as, again, the world's most significant problem. The, quote, scientific community was united behind the fact that this was a critical problem which had to be dealt with. We saw Jimmy Carter running around the White House with his sweater on making speeches about this subject. And here we are today talking about getting all excited about uh, global warming. Um, and clear, and, and uh, the scientific discussion itself, in, in many cases, is ridiculous. I mean, the, the questions being asked, um, do we have climate change? Well, of course we have climate change. Climate change has existed ever since the world has existed, and it will exist so long as the world exists. The climate is always changing. Everything about the Earth is continually changing. Does man influence the climate? Of course man influences the climate. Uh, from the, starting from the absurd example, every time I sneeze, I am impacting in some fashion the entire world. Of course, what is the significance of that? It's, it's so minute, it's ridiculous to even discuss it. But so, of course, man affects the climate. Um, the, uh, there's an article, interestingly enough, on this very subject today in the Wall Street Journal, on the editorial page, about why the uh, public respect for the, for the scientific community is declining. And I think this is the reason why it's declining. Uh, I commend that article to everyone. Um, scientists need to speak up in their fields with the facts. And unfortunately, we human beings have to be hit over the head with a two by four before we generally react to those facts. But right now there is so much misinformation dominating the discussion. Uh, perhaps a majority of the people, certainly in our country today, are operating under completely false notions about what's really happening uh, on the earth today. And we're, we're undertaking ridiculously expensive projects to re-engineer the entire world and this will have no effect whatsoever on, quote, climate change. I, I guess I will get off my soapbox now and um, let somebody else on. I, 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 I think we all appreciate that, uh, what you said. And I'm going to put this question out there, this for everyone. And I'm going to specifically also, in a moment, go to Alberto Viscara, who may have looking at everything he's heard, have some comments as well. So here's what the question is to everyone. Uh, and specifically, this would be uh, particularly uh, General Clegg, uh, Colonel Faggett, and uh, Helga, among others. How can the present process of fighting not only this pandemic, but the proliferation of new pandemics and new disease create a new health platform? How can the process of fighting it create a new health platform? And what are we speaking about in terms of the energy and logistical needs required uh, to do that, including the use of the need for water and other such things? So that's the question. Uh, anybody want to respond in particular? So I'm going to have to pick somebody. I see Helga's there, and I guess Walter's about to tune in. So, Helga, why don't you go first, and we'll go to Walter. The reason why I mentioned uh, the CDC report from yesterday about the so-called superbug is, you know, uh, it took a while before people realized that it doesn't help you if you are all vaccinated in the United States or in Germany or wherever if at the same time in Brazil, in India, in Africa, you have an explosion of uh, mutations because these mutations come back. Now, if this problem is getting scary enough, I still have the hope that eventually there will be a rethinking that a pandemic is a pandemic because it's worldwide and that unless you deal with this problem in every single country, you are not doing much good for yourself because you are risking that it comes back and haunts you because it may make the vaccines you already have applied uh, obsolete. So I think I still think that, you know, as things get worse and 
I really think the reason why I put all these things together, the, you know, the flood, the wrong explanation for the flood, uh, the pandemic, the, the lost war in Afghanistan, I think we have to come to a point to consider that there is something fundamentally wrong in the axioms of the politics in general. And that what, what I'm trying to get is a new paradigm of thinking, you know, this is a very big subject and would probably require a whole day conference to, to give justice to it. But the bottom line is that, you know, we have to think, you know, how the universe functions. And we have to bring the political and economic and social life on the planet in cohesion with the laws of the universe, which are anti-entropic. And the question of the human mind is the most advanced aspect of the evolution of the of the universe. If you start with that, you come to an image of man, you come to a understanding of the laws of the physical universe, and then that has certain implications. And then you come to the conclusion that we are not in a, fi in a closed system. The limits to growth the uh, theory is completely fraudulent because it assumes that the planet is a closed system, while the little blue planet is just a tiny planet in a huge universe where at least two trillion galaxies are known already. And, you know, that has certain implications. And I, I really would think that this question of bringing the life on Earth in cohesion with the lawfulness of the universe is a very important philosophical approach. Okay, then Walter, did you have something? I think you were trying to say something. Yes. Go ahead. I first want to. I'm going to thank the panel. I'm a. I was a chemistry major in college, but I tell you, this was like a, a course to me. I learned so much from all the experts on the panel. I was especially impressed uh, with the slide in which they showed the uh, comparison of life expectancy and availability of energy. I think that was a very, very uh, profoundly important slide. Uh, but I think also uh, points to the fact. Until we tackle uh, the issue of biosecurity uh, represented by worldwide pandemic, there's not much we're going to do in uh, many other things. Uh, we know how it impacts on the economy already. And I think uh, Robert Solik from uh, World Bank made, made a statement in the Washington Post in, in terms of biosecurity being much like the transnational threat of climate change. We cannot address it country by country. And this really emphasizes, as uh, Helga was saying before, how we need to have, in order to have health security for everybody, uh, we have to have major developed nations collaborating to have a modern healthcare system. Again, this is our chance to prevent the war of tomorrow. I don't know if you folks have, ever, have seen that movie. Uh, what we're looking at now, uh, with all the new uh, viruses that we're anticipating, uh, what we do about this pandemic uh, is really going to uh, be the, the future of mankind. So uh, I, I, I won't take the time to uh, elucidate all of the things that uh, we want to recommend in terms of uh, having every nation have a modern healthcare system. But I think this conversation enhances the possibilities for indeed making energy more available uh, to developing nations will, will enhance their ch chances of improving healthcare systems in those particular countries. So uh, I, I think I've raised more question uh, than I've, I've, I've answered, but uh, I wanna thank the panel again for uh, opening up a lot more doors for me. Thank you. Sure. So, Alberto Viscara, let me just ask what comment you have either on that question or anything uh, that we've talked about up to now. This is translator at the ready. The interpreter is not receiving any sound in Spanish. I see. 
Do we, do we, do I have to uh, pero okay. okay, now it can be heard. Yes. Okay. Gracias. Okay, thank you very much. What I was saying is that I don't believe that uh, the question alluded to these matters that I can discuss specifically, but when um, Richard spoke about the discussions that he had here in Mexico in terms of uh, commercial binational uh, agreements, which are uh, discussed in terms of NAFTA or what's known here as to the TLC or on the Mexican side, the free trade agreement between the United States and Mexico and Canada. This reference is very important because we need to take note of the fact that none of these great projects, these binational projects that have to do with the great limitations that we have for growth and especially the problems we have vis-a-vis -vis water, it, none of this is dealt with in the NAFTA agreement or its modern forms. Basically, it's a treaty which wants to just reach certain trade agreements and to take advantage of cheap labor on the Mexican market for the purpose of cost reduction for the consumer market in the United States and for the world market. So in this treaty, Mexico has gotten nothing positive out of it. Quite the contrary, we've had a fall off in all physical economic aspects of our national economy. So that's why it's so important that we take up again what had been posed going back all the way to the 1960s and which was abandoned and given up on since the agreements were, uh, the Ben Woods agreements were broken up. And I think this is a subject matter that will be taken up in the next conference. And this is one of the points which, uh, which Linda LaRouche very wisely took note of going back to the 1970s as an inflection point, a decisive turning point that would leave us to the torturous situation which the world is facing today. And especially the difficulties we're facing in the countries in the South. Clearly, we need a world financial system that would have to do with everything to do with the physical economic processes and those processes which increase not only the uh, p uh, the e potential equi potential cap capabilities of labor but of the nature itself to be able to increase the platforms of growth of the countries themselves Linda LaRouche then and we here in and Mexico felt we were uh, uh, preferred by him who cared much about us but he found it so important about the relationship of the United States and Mexico that he would always pose in that relationship a potentiality an exemplary singularity for the entire world I think that that possibility exists it's latent especially as we're facing such extreme difficulties when we've reached the extreme problems that we face today and I think that the the utopia of the green world of, of uh, this whole idea of a climate Armageddon clearly on its own there's doesn't have any future but it's a something that is so false that it is going to collapse as rapidly as it has risen up in the last months and years. So I think we are at that turning point, that branching point. And if we take up the purpose of telling the whole world that Mexico, the United States, Canada can green one of the greatest deserts of the world. And if we can create a, an ecological change on a hemispheric level, raising the potential of growth, the, the economic growth in this entire region, and converting the desert, changing it from, from a, a mirror, which is getting rid of clouds, but rather a growth area with can bring in the, bringest, the greatest growth, rainfall, and so on. We will see that man is not a, a, a bad thing for the hemisphere. It's not something that is a negative condition, but is rather a blessing who can help transform the entire 
uh, nature for the benefit of all of humankind. This will signify millions and millions of tons of grains to feed the entire world. This will mean conditions, climate conditions, which will be encouraging life for the whole hemisphere and for the entire world. So we should fight for that together and, and let's get the scientists out of their cubicles. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, Richard, we're going to come to you in just a minute. Just, I just want to check one thing. Dr. Kim, I have a question that we're going to be directing to you and to Richard McPherson in just a minute. I was told that you might have had your hand up before. Did you have something you wanted to say before? Or is that not the case? Okay, I guess not. All right, fine. So, Richard, let's go to you, and then I'll ask the question of uh, after. I think you're uh, muted. Richard, you're muted. Alberto, gracias. Okay. Um, in 2004, the new uh, president of Mexico put in a new secretary of energy. And the new secretary of energy organized a small group of, of uh, advisors. The... Uh, man in charge of the Laguna Verde power plant, knew me from the International Atomic Energy Agency and suggested that they bring me down there to talk to them. So people only think of me as a nuclear person, but I'm really an all energy person. So I decided to take down there with me a paper that I'd written about Pemex and how Pemex could save $2 billion a year for the Mexican government. I went down and spent a week with him. I went and visited the old friend from uh, Laguna Verde. Spent time with the, uh, most of the week with the entire new crowd for the uh, uh, energy ministry. And we also went to visit the president of Pemex with my plan that I'd written. The president of Pemex immediately dismissed us as not interested. But the new energy crowd was very interested in doing things with Mexico. Unfortunately, I haven't seen much of that happen. I've seen almost none of it happen. And what everybody is talking about here is organization and the lack thereof and cooperation. <clears throat> I suddenly have a feeling about this group. Probably... Some of you know about the annual Davos Economic Conference that's held every year in Switzerland for the last 51 years, the last 50 years. I followed that very closely for lots of years. And I will tell you that this crowd that I'm listening to and watching right now should be on equal footing with that crowd. But not just equal footing, but what we have to say, what you all have to say, what we're saying here is far more helpful to the world than what they're doing in Davos. Because in Davos, it's self-interest it's self -interest for a bunch of billionaires around the, around the world, and it's not for the people of the world. And what I'm hearing with everybody here, it's for the people of the world and for the good of the world. So I'm real humbled to be even a small part of this. I know a little bit about energy and economics, and that's about it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we all appreciate that. Uh, this question is directed at Dr. Kim and at Richard McPherson. Uh, it's two parts. And uh, the first uh, is, is a, a discussion about small modular reactors and micro reactors. Uh, tell us what one of these micro reactors is capable of as a person that had gotten on and sort of came in in the middle of that discussion. Uh, uh, and I, Dr. Kim, that, that was directed specifically at you. And then Richard... A very specific question was asked, which was, could the United States today redevelop, retool, and rediscover its industrial, scientific, and productive capabilities, which might be slow at, at gearing up at first, but could increase to mass production? And I think they're asking here about the idea of uh, modular design of reactors as opposed to craft-designed reactors. Um, and can we, could we reach anything like the kind of thing that we had seen in the Second World War? So let's go to Dr. Kim first, and then we'll come to you, Richard. 
Well, I think that small modular reactors and the micro reactors are the answer for Africa. And there are a number of reasons for this. One, as I said earlier, is the size of Africa. Therefore, there are many uh, situations I can imagine where there can be a small grid around a small modular reactor, maybe 10, 20 kilometers wide. And you can put it, say, where a mining complex is or put it where you want an industrial area. You don't have to connect it into a nationwide grid before it becomes valuable. So this idea of a nationwide grid existing before you have sufficient power points is wrong. You should put power points in the form of small modular reactors uh, where you want the power. If you can link it into the national grid, all well and good, but that's not necessary. Similarly with micro reactors, as was said earlier, uh, the micro reactors can be buried underground. There's all sorts of ideas that will come up. In fact, uh, here in Pretoria, we started developing small modular reactors in the early 1990s. Uh, where we are now, is two have been developed. Uh, one is ready for uh, us to go ahead with a commercial program to put it into operation in half a dozen years' time. A huge amount of work has been done. Fuel manufacturing was perfected here. It was done. These uh, balls that go into the, this type of reactor. And those have all been done here. There's also a micro reactor <laughs> development here of 10 megawatts. And ideas are to look at like African usage, also usage for many similar places around the world. Um, some time ago, I was invited to be the speaker at a conference in Hanoi. And I met the head of nuclear for Indonesia, who had also attended there. And uh, I was talking about the large spaces of desert sand that have to be crossed in places like Africa and so on. He said, yes, but look at Indonesia. We've got all these islands with water in between them. And I must admit, it struck me, I thought, good heavens, he's quite right. He says, we can't run cables between each island. And uh, so we have to put something like small modular reactors, micro reactors, and so on, on, the, um, on these different islands. So I see all sorts of opportunities that will come about for these technologies. Okay, and Richard? Okay, um, I have uh, gotten very involved in how to go back to manufacturing reactors on a large scale. And I can't tell you too many specific details right now. The question that you asked was, the, could the United States? The answer is easy, yes, it is. Um, in the last four years, I found a company here in Idaho, state of Idaho, Blackwood, Idaho. The company is called Premier Technology Incorporated. They've been making parts for reactors for people around the country for the past 20 years. They have what's known as a uh, NQA1 quality assurance program under the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. They've done over a thousand manufacturing jobs under NQA1. It's a small company owned by a man and his wife. It may be a small company in some people's eyes. It's a gigantic company to myself. I got them to make an agreement with a reactor designer out of Tennessee, Dr. Paul Murata, for a micro reactor. Um, I can tell you through the use of some existing um, robotics, some increasing robotics and the use of artificial intelligence. The company is gearing up to be able to do hundreds of units a month of a 10 megawatt size of a natural circulation molten salt nuclear battery that has no moving parts other than the control system. There are no pumps. There are no valves. It's what I call simplicity in design. It is the simplest design I've ever seen. And I've had an opportunity to see most of the designs around the world. And when you talk about places that uh, a mine, um, a water pumping station, a small city, 
what Kelvin was talking about was Kelvin was really talking about getting away from the grid and going to microgrids. And that is really the trend of the world. There are too many issues with the way that we've put in these long transmission lines. The molten salt nuclear battery will allow us to put electricity directly to the user. Electrical systems are generally divided into a production system, which is a power plant of some sort, that then goes into a transmission system, and then it goes into distribution systems. Each one of those three segments of delivering, producing and delivering electricity has to have its own profit center. And they have their attendant overheads. They also have line losses. And depending on the country, there's an average line losses that go anywhere from about 5% to 20%. The molten salt nuclear battery delivers electricity directly to the user without those three segments in their overhead. It also eliminates the line losses that we have in long, long lines. There will be something I would venture to say by September that will be very public about the molten salt nuclear battery. I have a, I have a team of 54 people, 54 nuclear people that work with me. Most of us came from the U.S. Navy program. We've assembled it in the last five years. We try to help everybody. We try to help everybody in the United States. Um, we right now are real focused on the molten salt nuclear battery because we know how it will be manufactured. The manufacturing plans are just now being completed. I suspect they'll be completed within the next year. And we can start manufacturing these, not just for domestically in the United States, but also for the rest of the world. And I know that Dr. Paul Murata is uh, amenable to licensing the manufacturing technology to other countries. I will say that, um, probably shouldn't, but I will, <laughs> using uh, supercomputers, the fuels have already been looked at for uranium, plutonium, and thorium. All three of those fissionable, product, fissionable materials can be used in a molten salt nuclear battery. Uh, the most likely one is going to be uranium for a while. Then we'll see the uh, use of thorium. People think that thorium is easy to use, not so easy to use. The reason that they ran plutonium through it is because there's a bunch of plutonium laying around the world that needs to be used up, and people are planning on spending. They are not planning. They're spending a lot of money on figuring out how to hold on to it and store it, and you don't need to do that anymore. So your question about can the United States gear up? Yes, but so can a bunch of other countries, including South Africa. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm going to just take one uh, final question. I, unless, Helga, you have something you want to say at this point? If not, I'm going to go to one final question for Mr. Romanello. And being cognizant that it's now 10 minutes to midnight in South Africa, uh, we're going to begin to do wind-up right after Vincenzo takes this question. All right, so the question is the following pretty straightforward one, but and it, I know that you had it in your, your presentation uh, in the set, part that we weren't un unable to show. Question is, it was mentioned that nuclear reactors produce very small amounts of waste. That's contrary to what I have heard in the past. One account claimed that the United States has a football field-sized nuclear waste dump site. Can you please shed more light on this? So it's a waste question. Well, uh, when we speak about nuclear waste, we have to understand waste that we're speaking about. There are three types of waste. There, are, there is low level, intermediate level, and high level. Low level represents 90% of the waste and does, does not represent a serious problem. What is the real waste, which represents our problem, is high level waste. And high level waste represents a very tiny amount of, uh, of material. Just a football, football uh, camp, for example. 
So very small, because one nuclear power plant produces few cubic meters of waste of this kind of this high level waste. A lot of waste actually, but high level waste, very tiny amount. One citizen would produce a small bowl of, of this waste in uh, in one year, of course. So waste is not a problem. Waste can be handled in geological repositories if there is the will to do it. Science and technology can handle waste. Moreover, there is the transmutation technology about which I was not able to speak, but there are a lot of studies of dedicated conferences of scientists working on it, or trans of projects of transmutators which can transmute waste. Of course, I, it would be, I would need a lot of time to discuss and, and, and explain this in detail, but there are many ways to handle waste. Maybe dedicated discussion should be needed. However, what I say, be very careful because media is not telling the truth about waste. It's simply scaring people exactly as they are doing with, the, uh, with global warming. And just to conclude my, my, my speech, I would like to, to put some points about the discussion up to now. First, the political influence on, on science. When we speak about the political inf uh, influence on science, we have to understand how it works today in a very dangerous and bad way. Because if a, pol if a crazy politician decides, for example, to stop diesel engines by 2035, he or she will never say, I want to do that. We'll say, simply, there is climate change. Scientists say that there is climate change and you all will die. And obviously, there will be some scientists which will say, yes, this is true. And this happens because of science, many scientists are waiting for funds, and funds come from governments. This is a very bad circle, which should be interrupted somehow. Very bad and very dangerous. Second thing, consensus. Let's remember that Galileo, Galile consensus was against Galileo Galilei at his time. Consensus was against Albert Einstein, even re relatively recently. In fact, we remember that Albert Einstein won the Nobel Prize for physics, but not for the theory of relativity, but for, for photoelectric effect. And finally, one, one uh, uh, thought about the small modular reactors. We can design whatever we want, small modular reactors, uh, fusion reactors, helium-3, but at the end of the day, we will have to ask ourselves which is the cost of the, the new developed technology, because if other technologies would be cheaper, it would be a problem for us. Well, for example, it was mentioned the small modular reactor and a molten salt reactor in Czech Republic, the research center RASH, is designing a small uh, a micro reactor, 20 megawatt power, which can produce heat or electricity. It is cooled with molten salts, it is fueled with triso, and the, its uh, power density is so low that meltdown is impossible. And uh, we are trying to design, to, to develop and to, to build a mock-up of this reactor. So there are ideas, there is the technology, but as a nuclear engineer, I have to, to, to warn you that sooner or later we will hit the wall of the price. And uh, so this will require some development. And it is not written anywhere that uh, we will be able to do it. And there's a final remark. I would say that the future can be bright or can be dark. It is not written, uh, this is not uh, sculpted in, the, in any marble table with lightnings by God. It depends on us, on how rational, peaceful will be our approach. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go to Dr. Kim and for any final remarks that you have at this point. I think you're, are you muted? Please, please unmute, Doc. You're, on, you're muted. How's that? Yeah, much better. Um, nuclear is incredibly important for the world and particularly for Africa. And uh, many people must understand that because there are too many uh, persons saying in newspapers and so on around the world that it's not Africa's thing. Africa's not ready for it. But in fact, there's a dozen African countries that have already formally notified the International Atomic Energy Agency that they plan to go nuclear. South Africa has had a nuclear power station running for nearly 40 years now. It's the most southerly nuclear power station in the world. And so we will experience this business. But what I see for Africa now is that we have small modular reactors, 
but we can link them together a lot too because of modern internet techniques. So we can have a network of reactors where there's central control rooms that we can see the temperatures and different reactors and pressures and so on, and questions can be asked and traded backwards and forwards. We can exchange training. There's all sorts of networking possibilities so that we can do a lot together, and I see that as very important so we don't have to duplicate many um, regulators and many processes and all sorts of things like that. Here in South Africa, just on the nuclear waste thing, we've had a nuclear waste repository, possibly one of the biggest in the world, running for about 35 years now, very efficiently. It is not yet taking high-level nuclear waste because the politicians haven't yet decided to do that, but there's no reason why it can't. So the, the anti-nuclear lobby in the world wants to make nuclear waste an issue now that people like the European Union are saying that nuclear is considered green because it doesn't emit carbon dioxide. I say, yes, but look at the waste. The waste is not an issue, as Dr. Romanello said. It's a very small volume, and when professionals are handling it, it's nothing for the public to be scared about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alberto Viscara will come to you in a moment. I just want to alert your translator so that they get there on standby. Uh, and so General Clegg will go to you before uh, first. Any final remarks or summary uh, statements? Uh, am I on right now? Yes, you are on right now. They're just getting ready over there. No, I, I'm very encouraged by everything I've heard here today. Uh, Maybe things are not quite as negative as I sometimes think they are. Um, but uh, I, I think uh, initiatives like this uh, can only serve to, to uh, help spread correct information about the nature of these problems and, uh, and defeat uh, a lot of the propaganda around uh, which, uh, is, which purports to point in the right direction, but almost inevitably is the wrong answer. Okay, well, thank you. Now we'll go to Alberto Viscara. We just want to make sure he gets unmuted and then we can hear. Bueno, me escucho? Yes. Bueno, que me, solamente me gustaría... I would just like to uh, thank you for the invitation to send a big abrazo uh, and my appreciation to everything, and especially with all my love to Helga. And we admire her tremendous perseverance, and we too are involved in of trying to imitate that perseverance, I believe. It would seem that we are in an era in which they are trying to impose on us the idea that that which is rational or reasonable is impossible. But as that great Mexican president, Jose Lopez Portillo said, we really are facing the moral imperative to make possible that which is reasonable. And many of the things which have been presented here, which have been presented here from the standpoint of science, from the standpoint of the great infrastructure projects, uh, for the world and for our hemisphere are absolutely reasonable and therefore possible. I believe that if we maintain this kind of international coordination, if we grow in our joint purpose of this kind of international coordination, the world has hope. And once you become part of that hope for the world and humanity, there's no room for failing there's no room for pessimism. There's only room for optimism and trust that we will be able to leave for the future and we will accomplish in this present the steps that are necessary for the great solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard, I think we'll go to you next. Helga, thank you for continuing this. I am... Um, <clears throat> I am more than pleasantly surprised at what I hear from this crowd. 
and I will do everything I can to support the efforts of this crowd. I'm at a time in my life that I'm trying to give back. Um, I tried to escape nuclear power ever since I retired from the Navy in 1983. I've been unable to do it. I moved to Idaho to learn how to fish and retire, and they found me three months later. And in the summer of 2016, I said, okay, you people will not leave me alone. So I'm in with both feet. And I do not have anybody that I need to answer to, or I'm not looking for a job, not looking to get advanced. So they're going to hear the truth about energy and nuclear power from me. And I'm up to my eyeballs in it. I will tell you that this is not meant to be arrogant, but I really don't care a lot about nuclear power. It's really easy to me. What I care about is under the nexus of agriculture and water. And me getting to help people and get people together under the solutions of agriculture and water, I'm just using my work in nuclear power to do that. Because we have energy with, without the energy, we will not have the water and the agriculture that we need for the world. Period. It requires energy. I listened to, I forget his name, he just talked about the cost of it. I will tell you that we are now going to get the cost of nuclear power down to a market clearing price per kilowatt hour that no one has ever seen before. Thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this. Thank you very much. All right. So, Colonel Faggot. Oh, you're muted. Well, thank you, Helga and Shell Institute, really, for including me on this panel. Uh, again, I look uh, forward, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to coming to Idaho and learn how to fish. <laughs> and also, continue to hear more about uh, nuclear energy. I think uh, that association of improving energy access and really resulting in life, increased life expectancy was uh, an association I had, hadn't really thought about before. But once we get, once we get health security for everyone, uh, and once the major developed nations begin to assist other nations, I think uh, it's going to reset the stage for a lot of the innovative recommendations from this panel uh, to be made a reality. Um, I think, again, uh, if we defeat this pandemic, the lessons learned, I think, will prevent a war of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess we've had everybody so far, right? Yes, I got everybody. So, Helga, I think you're now uh, taking us to our conclusion. Well, uh, I want to tell Richard, you are not the only one who is happy to be with this crowd. I can say the same thing for me. Look at me as a person, you know, coming from the green Germany. It, it's a real pleasure to be among people who are not crazy about nuclear energy. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, you know, I mean, I think this nuclear technology, uh, you know, the fission, the different generations of fission, high temperature reactor, uh, hopefully soon thermonuclear fusion, these are absolutely important for the long-term survivability of, of men. And my late husband, Lyndon LaRouge, he, you know, one of his unique contributions was to show the correlation between the energy flux density in the production process and the correlated uh, relative potential population density, which can be supported with that higher and higher energy flux density. And that is a law of the universe. This is not an arbitrary uh, question because at each level of development, you will have a certain degree of exhaustion of resources, of cost, and therefore you have to go to the next higher level uh, of, of energy flux density. Now, this, for example, let Professor Schulten, who uh, Dr. Kem, you probably know or knew, uh, Professor Schulten was the person who developed the high temperature reactor in Germany. And when it became clear that because of this green insanity, it was impossible to realize in Germany, he gave the entire technology to the Chinese because he had many assistants working in Jülich at the time. So he gave it 
to the Chinese and said this technology is so important that I rather give it to the Chinese than having it not developed. And now the Chinese have the high temperature reactor practically ready, you know, in in in, in a short time to to become an efficient commercial uh, energy source. So I think you know. This is really an important question because, you know, the advancement of civilization requires a completely different thinking than we have seen it so far. And, you know, I just want to mention one thing in this context, and this is Dr. Beasley, who, uh, you know, uh, has said that there are 40 million people immediately faced with starvation. Now, I mean, there are more people uh, over the year, but there are 40 million people who could die while we are sitting here talking. And he appealed to such billionaires as Bezos, Zuckerman, uh, Elon Musk, and said, you all made, in the year of the pandemic, between 60 billion, I think one of them and the other one 40 billion and still another one 10 billion. Can you not, be, uh, among you billionaires of the world, each give 5% of your profit and, you know, because we need from the World Food Program now 8 billion to save these 40 million people. And can you not, instead of going to your space travel, which takes you 10 minutes into outer space, give that money, you know, to, to feed these people. And I think that shows you really what's wrong, you know. And I think we have to have these kinds of discussions because, you know, I think, you know, I would really ask all of you nuclear scientists and, and scientists in general to join the Committee of Coincidence of Opposites, which so far was medical people, uh, farmers, you know, um, um, people of goodwill of various kinds. But I think if there would be a very conscious component in the Committee of Coincidence of Opposites from the field of science, it would be really good and, and, and bring the whole question forward a lot. So that would be my request. All right, very good. So Dr. Calvin Kem, General Peter Clegg, Professor Vin Vincenzo Romanello, uh, Colonel Faggett, we're summarizing, uh, Richard McPherson, and Alberto Capriscara. Thank you very much for being here. Of course, Helga Sepp LaRouche. And uh, I want to thank everybody who was tuned in, uh, many people for the entire time, for today's conference. There will be uh, more of these. Matter of fact, I understand there'll be another one next week, actually, which Helga has instigated, uh, which concerns the prospect for uh, peace through economic development in Afghanistan. Uh, that rather than the idea of the a graveyard of empires. This could be the cradle of a new form of world development. And we'll be doing that actually exactly one week from today, uh, I believe starting at 10 a.m. Uh, next Saturday on the uh, July 31st. So we welcome all of you to be with us for that. Um, I'd just like to otherwise um, uh, thank uh, Sally Fernandez, who uh, is the author of a book called Climatized, who gave me the idea to make sure that Tom Weissmiller, Dennis Avery, Dr. Hal Doiron and uh, others were, uh, were recognized. They are all our characters in the book she wrote. The book is a fictionalization about what would happen if it were discovered that many of the world's scientists that had discovered that cl climate change was basically a fraud were suddenly being eliminated by a nefarious power. That's not to wish that on anybody here. It's simply to point out that she uh, has said to me, you know, sometimes you have to go to fiction in order to be able to get reality across. And uh, I think that what this, pa this panel proved today and also the entire conference is you don't have to go to fiction. It is possible to find people who stand up for the truth and do it boldly and without artifice, as uh, a famous president once said. So on behalf of the Schiller Institute, I want to thank all of you and thank everyone who is watching and just invite you all to join the Schiller Institute become involved with our uh, organization, become members of it, uh, and uh, participate in the way in which Helga has identified. And so on behalf of the Schiller Institute, I'd like to say good evening.